watching. On uh, camera today, uh, Clown One, Head oh, Clown. Head Clown? You're the only one who's worked yeah. for circus, Brian. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Head Clown, Brian Joubert. Yes, yeah, say hello, Brian. Oh, hang on. Everybody, Brian's going to say hello to you. Hello, there everyone. he is, everybody. Yes. There is Brian. Yes. yes, very nice. Excellent, excellent. Wonderful. As many of you will know, uh, this is a time of meditation and calm before the throes of the drive. Which is why we will speak in a calm and collected fashion like this. Absorbing the peace of the wilderness so that we might transfer that out again to the audience when the show begins. It is also a time of warming the muscles of the mouth. I thought today, Brian, I would do some old choir exercises. Ooh, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Brian. I'm rather impressed. Yes. And it's uh, 27 degrees Celsius, which is 786 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not really true, is it, Brian? No. That was a lie. It is a lie. Yes. And uh, it's actually 81 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, of course, the scale Fahrenheit named after somebody called? Dr. John Fahrenheit. Correct. I don't know if it was Dr. John, but it was certainly, <laughs> it was certainly Fahrenheit. That is correct. Yes. Um, there was something else. Oh, yes. Uh, let us try again the black leather jacket, yellow leather jacket. Are you ready? One, two, three. Black leather jacket, yellow leather jacket, 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 black yellow jacket, black leather jacket, yellow leather jacket, black leather jacket, yellow leather jacket, black leather jacket, yellow leather jacket, black 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 Unbelievable. What an amazing tree. What an amazing tree that is. <laughs> Could you say, would you do the tree thing in the um, the voice of a uh, foreigner, Brian? The voice of? Foreigner. Or oh, um, you remember that song that you used to sing? No, um, Led Zeppelin. Oh. What an amazing tree. Could you do that? What an amazing tree. What an amazing tree! What an amazing tree! What an amazing tree! What an amazing tree! What an amazing, oh, what an amazing, oh, what, what an amazing, amazing tree! tree. Yeah, oh, what an amazing, hey. what an amazing, oh, what an Come amazing on, tree! Come out, everybody! Oh, what an amazing, oh, what an amazing, oh, what, what an, an amazing, amazing tree. tree! What an amazing tree! What an amazing tree! Very good. Well done, Brian. That oh, was thank you. That was good. Good job. It is an amazing tree. That really. was quite incredible. An astounding tree, one must say. <laughs> right, I feel my voice is now warmed up. <clears throat> Slightly raw. Slightly uh, raw, in fact, <laughs> yes. Look at this amazing tree, Brian. That would be ideal for a time lapse. Oh, yes. Yes. We won't sing What an Amazing Tree for a time lapse in the voice of Led Zeppelin again, will we? Uh, maybe, maybe. Yes. You never Unfortunately, know what the holds. Yes, but just, uh, you know, there are only 15 seconds left of our, of our little um, pre-show show here, everybody. And so, goodbye. This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised.
It's a very windy afternoon here on the reserve, but that has not stopped in Kahumas, and this is Safari Live. Ready. Standing by. Good afternoon and welcome to an incredible day so far here on Juma Private Game Reserve. As you can see, the Unkahumas have taken down another buffalo that seems to be slightly, well it was of course, uh, taken down uh, because of the droughts. Now, as you may know, I am Taylor and on camera with me this afternoon we've got David and aren't we so fortunate to have experienced something like this now they took down this buffalo about an hour and a half ago an hour and a half ago isn't that amazing and we were able to sit here and just come around the corner and be surprised by this incredible scene now we know it's quite sad of course and this is nature it's one of those things the lions are taking opportunity of all the weakened buffalo at the moment but this won't last for long. In a couple of months time, when we get our proper rains and the grass comes through, we know that the buffalo are going to take their revenge. And it's going to be a lot more difficult for these lions to take down buffalo. And that's what happens is that the tables turn. One moment it's in favor for the predators. And before you know it, the herbivores and that what used to be preyed upon on a regular basis come fighting back. Now isn't this amazing? Well, the little cubs though seem to be in enjoying the buffalo. The adults not too bothered and are quite enjoying the cool wind and having a nap and just relaxing. However, I can only see four lionesses here. Oh no, maybe there's uh, another one. Can you see? F I can't see five. David, can you see them? I also only see four, but it seems as though all the cubs are here. And it was indeed Amber Eyes who took down this buffalo. We were very privileged to catch the end of it, literally the last 10 minutes. We heard the distress call, so we came to see what was going on. And we found them just like the way they are now. Now remember, you are watching a live safari. And myself and James would love to hear from you today. Perhaps this is your first time watching. So if you'd like to chat to us or send in any questions, you're more than welcome to do so. And you can do so by hashtagging Safari Live on Twitter and then also sending in questions to questions at wildearth.tv. Now I hear young Mike is back from his holiday. I suppose I should let him know the good news. Mike Fotello. Welcome back. Uh, the Nkuhumas have uh, killed another buffalo. Uh, it's just myself here. We are uh, Wahlberg Swindams Junction. Here we go. Now my duty is done of informing the rest of the reserve of the Nkuhumas' success. Now. They haven't, of course, really touched the buffalo at all. Like I said, the adults have been resting, but perhaps in a little bit of time, if we're patient enough, they will come here and they will start to feast on the buffalo. I've got good news for you too. The, the, one of the Birminghams is around, but we'll try and have another look at them a bit later. But let's go back over to James, who's dying to say hello. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to this end of the sunset safari. It is a blustery, chilly day. Well, not chilly, it's actually quite warm at the moment. A beautiful herd of wildebeest, a sight that we're not going to see for too much longer because rain has come all the way to the Western Kruger and so these herds are going to spread out now. Um, I'm just going to turn the game drive radio down. Oh, that's very nice in my ear now. Uh, my name is James Henry on camera today. Brian. 
Led Zeppelin, the mustachioed woodland thumb, Joubert. Well done. Good. Now, what we're going to do is head very fast over to Cheetah Plains, well, at a relatively quick speed, in an attempt to see, I think it was 12 wild dogs there that were there, an unusual agglomeration of three or four different packs that have come together and formed one pack. Now, they were on the northern border of Cheetah Plains down this road. They may have gone into Nkoro, I'm not entirely sure. I think it's worth just quick having a quick run down there. Then we're going to come back and see if we can't find Karula. And, of course, you've been with Taylor and that incredible Nkahuma Buffalo Killer Pride. And we had an amazing time watching them just after lunch today, didn't we, Brian? We did. Yes. Yeah. That poor buffalo did take a time to die. But the interesting yeah. thing about it, and I'm sure Taylor will tell you, is that the lioness seemed to know when she'd done enough to kill the buffalo. And she did crush the windpipe and then she left it. And for a long time, it took a long time to die. But then it died on its own after about sort of 20 minutes of sort of gasping for breath and then it died. It was quite disturbing to watch, of course. There's just a vehicle in front of us, so we're going to move out of the way. While we do that, um, just to let you know, of course, we are completely live. Please do talk to us. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. We'll do our best to answer any questions you have, uh, address any comments you might wish to direct at us, and um, let's have a chat about Africa on this gorgeous, it's Thursday today, isn't it? Thursday afternoon. It's very difficult for us to tell what day of the week it is, of course. And we'll hopefully have an action-packed afternoon. Now, we're going to head straight back to Taylor and the Lions. We're going through a dodgy signal area. Hopefully, I'll see you again with some dogs. tally -ho. Isn't that exciting? If James gets it right and manages to catch the wild dogs, that'll be fantastic. It seems as though we may have a good afternoon ahead of us. Now, you can see a couple of the little cubs have got, sort of, it looks like they're wearing lipstick this afternoon. And something that we see quite often is, well, that we know that they're not strong enough yet to open up their carcass. So they're not covered in blood. Like when the adults go in and, and do open up the stomach cavity, those little ones will climb inside and they're small enough to reach all the incredible little bits. And it seems as though they were just eating around the very sensitive area on that male buffalo. And now they've full bellies. And some of them have gone back to the adults to have a groom. Seems as though that lioness has had enough, though. And you can see they're not, they're not fat. So they're looking on the lean side. So hopefully they will start to eat. And it is lovely and cool here this afternoon. We're suspecting some rain. Hopefully by this afternoon. Now, Miss Orr, you're wondering why the lions killed a buffalo if they're not hungry. Now, lions are opportunistic feeders, and, and this means that regardless of whether they're on another kill or not, if there's a, an opportunity to come around to potentially take down an animal, they will do so. Now, the Nkahumas are the exception of the rule when it comes to lions not being very successful hunters. Normally, they say... Every, out of every 10 attempts or so, they'll only catch something every three times. But they do have an advantage at this time of the year. Because we haven't had much rain and all the grass has disappeared over the last couple of months during the winter months, and now as we come into the last month of spring, we're getting a few downpours of rain. But the animals really are tired, they're hungry, They've exhausted all their fat reserves, and a lot of them are not as strong as what they normally would be during the green season, so when we have a lot of rain and grass. And therefore, this makes it sort of an easy capture for the lionesses. For example, it was only the one lioness, it was Amber Eyes, that took down this buffalo all on her own. Now, normally, that would be quite a difficult thing to do if it was a fit and healthy buffalo. It's not a particularly old one, it's a younger male, possibly only a couple of years old. You can see he hasn't quite developed a big boss just yet. And this is what we've been seeing over the last couple of days, even actually the last few weeks, 
as these younger buffalo obviously struggling to keep up with the breeding herds and lagging behind. Maybe they were on their way to drink from the Juma pan and unfortunately he was just too far behind the rest of the herd and then Kahumas are caught up with him. Now, like I said, one of the Birminghams is here. I think it's going to be very difficult for us to get a view for the moment, but it was in Fumo. We did also briefly see Tinyo, but he doesn't seem to be around anymore, so I wonder where he's gone. And, and what I'm hoping is going to happen is when they are brave enough to come over to the carcass, I'm hoping that we're going to, maybe we're going to see a bit of a, a dispute going on, especially once all the lionesses and all the cubs get up and start to feast on this carcass. But some of the little cubs are not quite ready just yet to wake, wake up. You can see the one that's flapping its paw in the air though had an early start. You can see by the red on, on its face. You need to get to have a good groom. Looks like it's got a leaf stuck to its face as well. But as the day cools down even more, the wind is blowing quite heavily, like I said earlier. We are expecting rain. I think that these lions are going to wake up and make their move towards the buffalo. Let's have a little look now. I said that it looked like there was possibly a leaf stuck on its face, but let's see if we can have a closer look as to what that was. And of course, now you know that we're live in case you were doubting it. As I say that, the little cub disappears behind the other end of the buffalo. <laughs> and that's what happens with things like this. But don't worry, we'll probably get another view again. And you can see that one little cub is tucking in, like I said, to the sensitive parts. They're getting the, their adult teeth and they're starting to grow bigger and bigger every time we see them do a yawn. We're able to see how large their teeth have become. And soon enough, they'll be able to tear open and that buffalo hide for themselves instead of having to wait and rely on the adults. But look at all those ticks as well that are covering that buffalo. The flies are also starting to settle in now. And they should, they'll probably stay there for a couple of days before they eventually move off. Maybe even some of them will come loose and move straight onto the lions, a new live host. Now, if you were watching a couple of days ago, <coughs> sorry. Now, Stephanie, you're wondering if all eight lion cubs are here or if they're still with the one female from earlier this morning. Now, I'm not certain. There's definitely one lioness missing. Amber Eyes is here and the youngest female is here. So it's possibly the lion with the, sorry, with the, uh, the two middle cubs is not here. I, I didn't get an opportunity to count them all as they've been moving around quite a bit between the carcass and of course they were in the drainage line a little bit as well but hopefully as they start to come through we'll be able to count them i must have mis miscounted earlier i thought i counted eight but i i, I could st i do stand under correction of course we'll try and have another look now oh, if we have a look at this lioness she's come over to the carcass now and you can see that she's drinking you see that now i think that's quite interesting because I don't think that that is blood. You can see her tongue doesn't seem to be becoming red, which it normally would. So I wonder if that's some form of a, a liquid coming out of the buffalo, perhaps from the nasal cavity, or maybe it's digestive juices, I'm unsure, but she seems to be enjoying it. Now this is something that we see with lions not having to drink water all the time because they get a lot of moisture from the blood. And then of course, like we just witnessed from them drinking various liquids that start to ooze out of the buffalo once it is passed on. 
Now, I was about to say, sorry, um, a little while ago, if you were watching a couple of afternoons ago, I mentioned that I'd like to do a little experiment with Inkahumas. And I said that I was going to try and give you a statistic and a percentage of how successful these lions have been in a six week work cycle. So it's probably just shy of six weeks, but I'm going to start having a look at Panthera, which is a carnivore project and even just an endangered species project that goes on particularly here in the Sabi Sands, but they've started to develop it throughout Africa now, where they don't just monitor lions, but they do leopards and serval and caracal, ground hornbills, all these, uh, all these beautiful animals. And what that project does is we basically record all the information, when the Nkuhumas have made a kill, what species they killed and the sex of it. So we'll try and work out from the 16th of October to the 19th of November how successful these Nkuhumas have been in that, in that period. Because like I said, usually not very successful, lions of course, but in this case, but it's absolutely incredible. Now, you see these little ones have taken a bit of a, <laughs> they've sort of stopped feeding on the carcass now and decided that they've built up enough energy to have a little play. But it's not too serious, not like we normally see them bounding around and around, jumping on top of each other. Perhaps we'll see that a bit later. Now, what is on that cub's chin? I can't work out what on earth that is. It doesn't look, I don't know if it's, it, if it's hurt itself. I don't think it would be playing like that. Let's see if we can get a better view. No, turn around and look at us for long enough, more than two seconds, so we can have a good view. I wonder if it's not just a piece of flesh from the buffalo that's now stuck onto its lip. You see that? Yeah, I see. I was worried at one point that maybe it had been kicked in the face or, and it had loosened a chunk of flesh, but it doesn't seem that way. It seems as though it's either a leaf that's been covered in blood that's now stuck onto that lion cub's chin or it's a piece of flesh from when it was feeding on the buffalo now you can hear the youngsters having an argument they're fighting over the one small spot that has already been opened on the buffalo and this will probably continue until these lionesses open it up And that liquid is still oozing out of the buffalo. I'm not sure exactly what liquid it is, but we saw her lap it all up. And then she'd finished it. And then since she went over and started biting on the belly, we've now seen that more of that liquid has come pouring out. So it's quite interesting. It must be a digestive juice of some sort that's now leaking through the nasal cavity and perhaps the mouth as well. Very, very interesting. And all the cubs now learning from that lioness and doing exactly what she's just done. If you heard that sneeze, and you can see the little cub glancing over into the distance, that's because Mr. Mfumo is laying fast asleep. But we'll go and have a view at him at some point. Hopefully once he becomes a little bit more active. And I can tell you now, you're all going to be very surprised as to how well his injury on his face has healed. Wonderful, I believe that James has just arrived on Cheetah Plains. How exciting is that? Let's go and see if he's managed to find those wild dogs. Now we are struggling a little bit with communications, everybody, but we are here on Cheetah Plains and Brian, have we found a cheetah? Um, similar colours, maybe? Sort of. Maybe. Similar hunting strategy? Oh, yes. But lives in a group? No. What could it be? I have no idea. Oh, a termite mound. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well done, Brian. <laughs> 
There we go, everybody. It's a little group of wild dogs. Go ahead. Isn't that wonderful? Copy, thanks. That's just Andrew saying we can approach. So, this is this, I nearly said herd, uh, pack of wild dogs. We think there are 12 of them. Not sure what they're going to do today. I'm quite surprised that they're still here because it's been a relatively cool day. But here we have them. Uh, I've only seen three so far. I heard that there were twelve. <laughs> I heard that there were twelve. No, man, I'm talking rubbish. There are three here, but there have been twelve. There were twelve, I think. No, there are more than three here. There are twelve here. Wonderful. It is them. Okay, let's stop here to begin with. Oops, let me put the gear in. Okay, so we've got them there under the tree, Brian. Let's try and count them as the uh, smell of wet dog and dog dung assails our nostrils. There we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Is that it? There must be another three around here. I think maybe behind the tree. Anyway, at least nine of them. And I gotta tell you, the smell, we've parked in an extremely bad area here. The smell is coming basically straight over the top of them into us. And what's interesting there, as Brian is showing you, is that that is a collar, obviously. And the collar comes from a pack, apparently called the Ngala pack. Now, Ngala is where I, of course, cut my bush teeth. And, uh, Apparently, this, these the two collared animals here, and the two collared animals are, I was going to say something of vital importance, they're from the Ingala pack, that's right, and I think that they're from a generation uh, that, came, that was born two years ago, so I think they're about two years old or so. They've come down here, they were known as the Ingala breakaways for a while, then there's some from the Manyaleti pack, apparently. Uh, I don't know, we don't know them, I don't think any of us have seen them before. I'm just going to move around a little bit, we'll see if we can't get a slightly better view of how many there are and get ourselves out of the firing line of the wind. That is a fantastic sight of a lot of dogs. Ha! Ah, isn't that cool? Shall we count them again? There's six in front here. And then one, two, three, four, five. I can see at least eleven dogs. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous animals, aren't they special? Now, everybody, yeah, you please send through your questions and things. I don't know if I'm going to be able to hear Rebecca in the final control. She is back from leave and back at the helm. Um, but if not, she'll WhatsApp me, and then I will be able to answer you via that method. Rebecca, would you do a communication test, please, into my ear? Yes, I'm hearing absolutely nothing which indicates to me that, in fact, things are not good. Now, the little ones in front there, that is definitely a pup from this year. So this is a brand new pack. Let's see how many, I think there's six pups and six adults. That's what Brent said. He chatted to the wild dog genius of the area. No questions just yet, everybody. Now, the other thing to note, of course, is that they are in the domain of those other three dogs that were known as the, what were they called? They were the, was it the Sabi pack? Those three that came through. Um, oh, I don't know, it's all rather confusing. Right, here we go. Uh, uh, Reese, Rais. Is there any reason why they have patchy coloration? Rais, um... Yes, there is a very good reason why they have patchy coloration. If you look, um, where's a nice spot for us to show you? Let's, Brian, you see that tree with the fallen over tree in front of it? If you wouldn't mind, just there, yeah, that one. Rais, on a, in the dawn light, when the sun's just come up and it's at a sort of, um, it's just off the horizon, at dawn and at dusk, the shadows cast by vegetation like that very much mimic the colors of these dogs. 
they're low to the ground, they move through woodland like this or through grassland, and you find that when the light is correct at dusk and dawn, you'll find that they're almost completely invisible. So they, it's just for camouflage. It's very much similar, I suppose, to the random camouflage patterning on a military jacket, if you like. Now, I don't think they're going to move a huge amount while we're here. I'm not sure how long we're going to be able to stay, but I think it's definitely worth spending a little bit of time with them. And then we'll press on and see what else we can see. They look pretty fat to me. If you look at that one there that's panting away, he's got quite a fat belly. And back onto the color. Sean, a nice question from you about whether or not um, about whether or not the colour will change in different areas. So perhaps if wood dogs in East Africa and slightly vegetation types have a different colour. No, no, not, uh, not, not in any meaningful way that you'd be able to say, well, these are definitely dogs from South Africa versus dogs from this part of the world. They all look pretty similar, but every dog, of course, has a unique pattern. And the only obvious variation sometimes is that they all have white tails every single one of them has a white tip to the tail bar very probably one in a hundred or so has got a black tip to the tail I've seen two in my time that have got black tips to their tail I'm just quickly going to talk on the uh, game drive radio stations I can broadcast from where I'm sitting with this pack um, but I'm afraid I can't copy unless you're close by. So if you're trying to get hold of me, animals are still static, same place, one station here. I'm not sure how many are responding. I'm just trying to help one or two guys decide whether to come into the sighting or not. For those of you who are new viewers, first of all, welcome, lovely to have you with us. And all I'm doing there, we're in a, an area where there are lots of safari lodges. And on those safari lodges, of course, people have just gone out and game drive. They've had a delicious cup of tea or coffee, uh, probably a healthy slice of delicious cake. And now they're out on game drive and they're coming to sightings like this and the sightings you've had with Taylor. Right, we have another question coming through. Ah, now this is of course a very, very good question for those of you who have never seen wild dogs before. From Greg asking about whether or not, or how you tell the hierarchy here and if there is one. Greg, it's exactly the same as a wolf pack. So we get a, we get a situation where uh, there's an alpha male and an alpha female. The hunt is led by the alpha male and the alpha female sort of follows him. Uh, sometimes she leads the hunt, it can depend. Then, the key thing, Greg, you can't really tell until they're up and they're moving. When they're up and moving, you can definitely tell who the alpha pair is when they're mating. Obviously, you can tell who the alpha pair is. It's exactly the same as a wolf pack where only the alpha pair will breed. Sometimes the beta pair does, and sometimes those pups survive, but normally it's just the alpha pair. And I'm not sure if the alphas are collared or if those are not, or betas, or perhaps... Uh, some Omega dogs. This look rather awkward, that, doesn't it? But I, I'm pretty sure they don't feel it anymore. I'm pretty sure they're very used to those collars. And the collar will send out a satellite signal. It'll send out uh, various probably information, probably even weather information, but largely I think it just tells people where these dogs are. And they do like to have a heavy sleep, a bit like the lions. And although uh, traditionally you will hear, of course, that they are diurnal predators, so they hunt during the day, and lions are nocturnal, all of that, that line is completely blurred, of course, as we've seen. The <laughs> Kahumas killed a buffalo in broad daylight today. These chaps are fast asleep. I'm sure they did kill this morning. But most predators are active crepuscularly. It's just which side of crepuscular they are. So crepuscular means active day, at least at dawn and dusk. And these chaps are active largely sort of as it gets light. Lions just before that, and then into the dusk time, they'll be active just before it gets dark, just before the lions get up and start to move. 
but of course, as Jamie Patterson likes to say very much, none of the animals read textbooks, of course, and they act according to the in their instincts and whatever suits best. Now, speaking of what they ate this morning, um, Brian, there's an, that one sort of, what should we say, a second from the left, just behind the one with the collar, has got an extremely fat belly. Now that tells me that they ate something substantial today, I think at least the size of an adult impala for them to be this satiated by this time of the day. And while we're talking about what they eat, Tim, you're interested in whether or not they will hunt cheetah. Uh, almost certainly not, Tim. Would they kill a cheetah if they happened to catch it? So if they caught perhaps an injured cheetah or took one by surprise, it would be highly unlikely, um, unless the cheetah had perhaps had a heavy night out. Uh, they would certainly kill it, Tim, but they wouldn't actively hunt cheetah. They're not anywhere close to fast enough. Um, cheetah, if they are aware of any attack from uh, any of the other predators, leopard, uh, hyena, lions, and wild dogs, of course, are more dominant than they are in the predator hierarchy. Uh, they're so fast, they will very easily just get away. <coughs> Gorgeous, gorgeous sighting as the wind goes blowing in from the southeast. We're supposed to have rain today, but um, today no rain so far. Gorgeous carpet of dogs. I'm just going to go back to the first question we had uh, while we watch those clouds scudding through the sky. I do like the term scudding clouds, don't you, Brian? Yeah, it's very nice. See how strongly the southeaster is blowing. And while we look at that, Rais, I just want to go back to your question, if you don't mind. Um, I, I just the patchy coloration. I mean, I said during dusk and dawn, of course, when the sun shines. But when we got here, Brian didn't see them at all. I didn't see them at all initially, and then we only saw three. And yet there were twelve lying here. So from a bit of a distance. They really are very obviously, um, or very unobviously coloured. And that one's just calling now. It's going wee wee wee, before it lies down. Now obviously the most clear thing about that sighting we've just had is the size of those ears. Now, Scott Dyson, who used to work with us here, I think explained very nicely why they have such big ears. Um, I'd certainly never read it before, but maybe that's because I haven't read it widely enough. But he said they've got those enormous ears, of course, not for hunting of their prey, but for them to hear each other when they're hunting. And they let out these loud, whooping calls. It's the most fantastic thing to hear when they're trying to get hold of each other. It's the most amazing sound. I'm not going to try and do it too loudly, A, because that dog will probably think I'm an idiot, and B, because, well, there's a game drive vehicle full of guests behind me, and uh, they will definitely think I'm an idiot. And it just leads on to the discussion of when we watch them hunt. And I was just thinking the other day that I thought perhaps we had, uh, throughout my guiding career, certainly, you know, these dogs get on the hunt and we jam the car into gear and we race after them and the other day I suddenly stopped and thought to myself hang on a second if they've got such big ears like that surely with us racing next to them we are disturbing those hunts and I often I've now come to the conclusion that we should hang back and of course we've got a we will hopefully soon be using a drone a little bit more often but you know, we haven't often seen them kill out here live. We've certainly seen them eat, but to catch them killing, I think, is a little bit um, is a little bit difficult. If you are chasing them through the woodland, crashing over trees, and um, you know, revving the engines, etc. Oh, look at this play now. Alrighty, we're going to see what unfolds here. 
Um, Rebecca via WhatsApp says that we are going to go back to T-Bomb and the inimitable Nkohuma Pride. It's incredible as to how creative the people are that I work with, with the amount of uh, nicknames that I get all the time. T-Mac, T-Bomb, Strayer, you name it, I get them all. Now this is another lioness that's got up from the one that we saw earlier. So let's see if she's going to be the one that decides to open up this buffalo. And then, well, it'll be quite interesting to see as all the little cubs, I presume, will come around and fight over this carcass. I've even seen a couple of vultures that were circling a little bit earlier. So that's not good news for the Nkuhumas. It means they're going to have to protect this carcass, otherwise it's going to be eaten. And you can see that that little cub is now scratching on the tree. You can see the beautiful claws coming out, which are normally kept hidden in the sheath of the paw to try and keep them nice and, and sharp and protect them, of course. But that didn't last too long before something else caught the attention, and I think it's that buffalo's tail that they've been playing with and fighting over. And I don't know if you've noticed as they start to play how their behavior is starting to change. Did you see that little one, how it had its ears flat back and snarling? And it was indeed the tail that they were fighting over. Did you see that? Let's see if they're going to keep pulling it. Now, it's obviously difficult for them to play with it, especially when it's still attached to the buffalo. They're very entertained with something back that side. Now, I would love to go around, but unfortunately there's so many thick trees that you can see that I don't think we'll get a very good view. So I think for the moment we've got the best spot in the house, and I think we will hold our ground here so that nobody takes it. I, of course, want the best view for all of you watching. I don't know if you can hear Mr. and Mrs. Hornbill singing. Oh, there we go. Now the cub has got the tail. And unlike us as children, and I was actually talking about this the other day, how I was given plastic containers or Tupperware and boxes to play with because that was my favorite thing. You've got to make your own toys out here. And we often see the Nkuhumas playing with branches and climbing the trees. But when there's an opportunity to play with a buffalo's tail, I think that choose that over and over again. Now this lioness is looking over. She's maybe just keeping a watchful eye on that male lion. It seems as though he's sat up now. I don't know if we if we'll get a view. Should I go back for you, David? Let's let's quickly go and say hello to Mr. Mfumo. Maybe he's going to come over. But like I said, you're going to be so surprised when you see how wonderful he's looking. Now. It feels as though it's been years since I last saw the Birminghams. Of course, it hasn't been years, but when I saw Tinyo this earlier today and Mfumo, they just look like they've grown. Their manes are starting to darken, but maybe you'll be able to decide for yourselves. Hello, boy. Here he is. And look at that. Oh, big yawn for us. Oh, lovely. Look at his face. Can you believe that big gaping hole that was once there is now healed up? to just a small little gash, and it's hardly leaving a real scar. That's incredible. Now he's waking up. I wonder if his next move isn't going to be perhaps around to where the carcass is. And of course, don't we just love it when they scratch themselves and they find the right spot. Look at that love, beautiful teeth. You can see he's still a young boy. But you'll see, if we get to see Tinyo, wherever he may be, wherever he has gone, his mane has gone very dark and very black. Another big yawn for us. And look at those, did you see all those little sort of barbs that they had on their tongue? That was incredible. Nice shot, David. It's always nice to see how sort of dense they are and how large they really are because we, we see them obviously licking and removing the hair from their prey. 
Well, it's got to be almost like sandpaper to be able to do something like that. Yeah, he's got the spot again. Now, you've had your siesta. I think it's time you go over and say hello to the ladies because they haven't seen each other for quite some time. And I suspect what happened is that as the lion, as Amber Eyes was taking down that buffalo, these boys must have heard that buffalo distressing and they came marching over to see what was all that ruckus was about. But they've kept their distance. The lionesses have showed a little bit of animosity towards them. So they're treading carefully. So it'll be interesting to see what their reaction is. They don't look particularly thin, even just from here. He looks as though he's got a, be a bit of a belly. So it's good to know. And perhaps that they have been feasting. Here he goes. He looks like he's making his move now. What I will do, though, is when he comes past us, I'm just going to change the angle of the vehicle just so that we can watch him as he walks towards the lionesses. But isn't he looking strong? They really look like they're developing nice muscle around their shoulders now. He's just marking his territory. Let's just let's try and get a better spot. We're going to try and sneak in this gap. There's some other vehicles that have arrived. Now, I suspect that we won't be able to stay here for too long. Probably only another, maybe we can push it to about 10 minutes. But that's fine. We'll let everybody else come through and we'll come back. I'm just going to go forward here. Hi, big boy. The reason being is because we want to get a good view as he approaches these two lionesses, which intentionally moved out and laid in the spot when they saw him approaching earlier. Now, let's see what happens. Oh, that little cub is very excited. We know how much they love the Birminghams. And I'm always impressed by the behavior of the Birminghams with the cubs. They're very, very tolerant of them. But you see, being submissive, you see that putting its, ducking its head, coming in low, which is very clever of the cub. But be careful. Oh, there we go. They are love. They are actually lovely boys in in the sense that they are seem to be very good fathers, which is not common with the male lions. There he goes. He's marking his territory as they haven't been around here for for a couple of days. Just making their presence known again. Look at those little cubs looking up to their dad, so proud. And of course, now we want to play with you. Now, as we sit here and we, we see that these lionesses are watching him carefully, Star Star, you were wondering, why don't the lionesses want this male lion to eat? So it's, that's not really the case with what's going on over here. Is often when the male lions come through, they, because of their size, they charge through and they will take over and try and dominate on a kill, which is obviously not great because... Most of the time, it's the lionesses that are doing the hunting. Of course, the boys help out. But these boys haven't been around, so they had nothing to do with bringing down the, the, of this buffalo. And it seems as though this male is sort of respecting that. He's been edging closer, just moving slightly, sort of just trying to gain the trust again of the lionesses we, we've seen. And over the past, uh, I think it was about the past two or three weeks, we saw a bit of... Uh, and disputes happening between the lionesses and the two Birmingham boys, and then again between Tignon and Fumo, as they were mating with the youngest lioness and Amber Eyes. But Mfumo seems to be, if I can say this, the nicer of the two boys. His attitude seems to be a lot more calm, a lot more relaxed. He tries quite hard with the Nkahuma females. I have to agree with you, Liz. Liz says that she thinks that the females tolerate Mr. Mfumo 
more over the other Birminghams, and I do, and I think it's because he puts effort in. And we don't normally see this with the females, but he, he makes a concerted effort to go up, he greets them, he doesn't just come charging in and race over to the kill and start feasting. Look at the respect that he's showing these lionesses. You saw the distance that he was at. Remember, we got here earlier today. And when they came over, they stopped probably about five or six times from 100 meters and started itching their way forward. And he, then he laid in the distance and waited. And now he's approached even closer. And... Um, Sorry, I'm just looking behind me quickly. And now he's sitting there waiting as well. And it'll be nice to see if he does get up and perhaps go over to those lions and nudge heads with them. And even just his behavior with the cubs. We see Mr. Tinio is, he's not too bad either, but he does get a bit grouchy and grumpy sometimes. Where Mfumo doesn't mind if the cubs jump on his head and on his back and bite his tail can tell you from what I've experienced with other male lions this is the first I've ever seen them being so tolerant the Charleston males which I often talk about from down in the south of Basabi sand are horrible towards the cubs they're constantly fighting as soon as the cubs approach them they growl or take a swipe at them and then all the lionesses get up and chase try and chase the males away and it ends up in big arguments and it happens every single time but perhaps it's because they're young boys and they don't know. Maybe they've been bullied by these females, which is a great thing, I think, in terms, instead of being those big boisterous lions like males have that reputation, and like I said, I've seen it my whole life. Maybe they're just young enough that these females are really showing them who the bosses are, and strength, of course, comes in numbers. So it would be very silly of him to try and, and hurt one of these cubs, whether it was by accident or just out of frustration or on purpose, and to have five lionesses turn around and come at you, he would get himself in a little bit of trouble. Even though he's bigger than them, he'd probably, he'd probably come out with his tail between his legs. So I think he's very cautious. And I'm really impressed with these Birminghams now. When I first arrived, I thought, oh, they're not, they're not proper lions. And I forgot how young they were. But just in the past two months, I've definitely seen a change in the darkness of the mane, muscle buildup. Now, Sir Rob, you're commenting and saying, is it perhaps because Mr. Mfumo is not hungry, that he's not being so aggressive. I've seen it when they were even thin and him approaching a carcass and it doesn't just come racing in and chasing the females off like normally male lions will do. So I don't know. I think they've just got a different temperament. Well, he has got a different temperament and I don't know what has caused that. Maybe it's genetics. Maybe, like I said, maybe it's the fact that he's, he's outnumbered big time here, five females versus just him. He seems to be the one that hangs around with the Nkuhumas the most. And of course, Mr. Tenyo comes in at second, just popping his head in every now and then. But he looks like he's completely moved off. He's not here anymore, I don't think. I've, I've had a good look around. So perhaps he's gone off to do a territorial patrol and he's left Mfumo here. And now we're going to watch. Let's see what his reaction is. He hasn't seen these cubs for a couple of days now. No, he's actually more interested in the lions. Now, that's the youngest lioness that he's gone up to greet. You see that? You don't normally see that, which I think is really, really wonderful. Look at them. It's like he's forming bonds with the different females. You see, rubbing heads with everybody. This is fantastic. And just earning their trust. That's, that's really lovely. This is a beautiful moment. They're also very curious of him. Maybe they've missed him. Maybe they are learning to love Mr. Mfumo. He's turning into a beautiful lion, though. He's, even though he's got those scars, his mane has become huge. Look at the young lioness. She's actually very excited. Oh, that's not, that's not the youngest lioness. Where did she go? She was here. Oh yes, there she is. Sorry, she's sitting on the right. 
and all coming over to say hello. And I'm so glad to hear that you're all taking lots of screenshots of this beautiful moment as the Pride is reunited with Mr. Mfumo. And what a nice, what a nice scene it's turned out to be. A little cub also getting in on the greeting ceremony. And of course, everything that they see, they will copy. And that's how these animals learn is they, a lot of it is instinct, but social bonds, of course, I think that they observe and then they put that into practice. I think Mfumo is searching for perhaps an area where maybe one of them were lying or maybe someone's urinated there. But of course, that's just a yawn. That's not him phlegm and grimacing. But now we'll wait and see what his next move is. I think this is lovely. This is such a fantastic opportunity to learn. And that's what this is all about, as we sit here and we watch. Oh, let's say hello to Mr. and Mrs. Wahlberg. They've come out. You could hear one of them calling. Where's the other one gone? Maybe just sitting on the nest. Now, if you're wondering who the Wahlbergs are, these are one of the smaller eagles that we see in the area. And they're also migratory, so they only come here in our summer months to nest, or sort of in spring, really, when as soon as it warms up. And this is a pair that I believe we've been following for quite some time, and they're very unique because they are pale morphs. So typically, they are the color, the entire body is the color of their wings, but you can see those lovely blonde feathers coming through. And we think that they've either had a chick or perhaps two chicks. Not sure just yet. It's difficult to try and see inside that nest. Oh, I, you know what I'm going to do, David? I'm going to reposition because I can see the other one sitting on top of the nest. So okay. not that one on the right. She, she, either she is down on the one below in the fork of the tree, which makes it quite difficult. So let's reposition so I can show you a little bit more. Exciting. There's so much to look around this afternoon, not just the lions, but of course. Let's have a look here. Let's see if we can get another view. Now, it's going to be quite difficult. There's lots of branches, so I've just got to do some bobbing and weaving to find a spot. Can you see it over there? You can just see the tail feathers. There we go. If you go down the, to the second net, there we go. Here you can see the other eagle. And I suspect that that's Mrs. Wahlberg sitting on, if there perhaps are eggs, maybe there's chicks inside there. But every time they've gone up, we haven't heard too much noise coming from the nest, which is typically what you would hear if there were hungry chicks inside. Hello, beautiful. And I suspect that if there are eggs, it's only, a, it's only fair that she does sit on them today because it's a little bit chillier than what it has normally been. And there's a, a cold breeze coming through, so she will need to sit on those eggs and keep them warm. But a very basic nest. Can you see that? Lots and lots of sticks piled in the fork of a tree. And they'll reuse these nests over and over. And every year they keep building them make them stronger but this is a relatively small nest if you see some of the nests from the other eagles my goodness they can be a couple of feet long a couple of feet wide they're very impressive but they all make these beautiful platform nests either on the top of the tree or if there's a fork big enough depending on their size they'll make it in the fork of the tree but look how windy it is up there. You can see the branches in the background blowing and of course her feathers ruffling quite a bit in the wind. That's wonderful. But let's go have another look at the lions just because I'm worried that we're going to have to leave the sighting shortly. 
Let's go see if anybody's feeding on the carcass. Let's have another little look here. This is amazing. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. Oh, it doesn't seem like anybody's doing anything on the carcass. Not yet. But there's no rush. Oh, it's just one of the little ones is having a bath. Oh, it's my favorite little girl who's getting all cleaned up. And she does seem to be a bit of a dirty cub. Every time I see her, she's either got leaves and grass stuck on her, or she's got a bit of mud on her paws. Or at the moment, she's been feasting on the buffalo and playing near the tail. So it wouldn't surprise me if she's been covered in a bit of buffalo feces. And obviously, mom is not too impressed with that. And I don't blame her. You can't go out in public looking all dirty like that. You're a little princess. You've got to be nice and clean. But I think her ear is looking better. Now, we were chatting about it, and I don't think it's flopping as much. It's still obviously quite swollen, and I think it's that's what's causing the ear to flop, is the fact that the tissue is all swollen, creating that ear to become quite heavy and then dropping down. So we'll see as this mange clean, uh, clears up, She's looking good. Perhaps so will her ear. Oh, big stretch. There we go. Sharpen those nails. I'm sure that feels good on her little tendons to give them a good stretch out, but not for too long. I don't think they really know what to do. Wonderful. I think what we're going to do is we're going to leave them Kahooms now. I think there's a couple of guides that want to come on in, but we'll come back a little bit later. Perhaps they'll go for a drink. So keep an eye on the damn camp. Let's go see what else we can find and let's go see how those wild dogs are doing. <laughs> wondering. Now, there we have one wild dog eating another wild dog's foot. <laughs> this is, of course, the joy of youth being played out in front of us there. Now, we've got a nice question about the teeth. Look at those teeth. You can see them there. And um, we've got a question, uh, well, in fact, a few questions about teeth. First one, from Cheryl about whether domestic dogs have the same kind of teeth as wild dogs. I think there is. Uh, Cheryl, I don't know for sure, and I mean, I've got a book that would tell me back at the camp, but I don't know now. I think that there is a slight difference, and I think if I remember correctly, the wild dogs have got one extra molar or premolar. I think that's what the case is there. I'm sorry, I cannot be more accurate about that. And then the kind of uh, a good one about sort of falling on their teeth from w when they go hunting and when they wean when they start to eat meat they'll start to eat meat pretty much from as soon as they come out of the den which is at about two weeks they'll come out of the den and then they'll beg for meat and the rest of the pack will regurgitate for them straight away now they wean relatively quickly i think in comparison with most other predators well, I suppose similar to uh, predators the same size. So they probably wean completely by three months, and now they're on a completely meat diet. And Marie, you're wondering when they'll be hunting. You'll find that they will hunt as soon as they are able to, um, uh, as soon as they're able to keep up with the pack. I think they're probably a bit small now, and as far as I remember, the sort of earliest time they'll start to actually contribute to a kill is at about eight months. So that's probably about sort of two or three months from now. They'll start to make an active contribution to the hunts. But you can see that those six adults are managing to do a very good job, superb job, of keeping everybody full. And the obvious question also to ask is how closely related to domestic dogs are wild dogs? And the answer is 
Uh, not very. They're in a different genus, but there is a school of thought that says perhaps they shouldn't be. Perhaps they are actually more closely related to domestic dogs than we think they are. Um, and they're actually quite closely related to um, jackals and to um, not coyotes. I suppose coyotes would be a North American version, but they're not, they're not distantly related. I don't, as far as I understand it, interbreeding would be completely impossible. Um, and so they're not closely enough related for there to be interbreeding. I used to give, my answer to that question used to be that no, they're completely different, um, you know, they're in a different genus, which means that they are, you know, that they couldn't interbreed at all, there would be no possible chance, and, you know, they're completely different animals. But it would seem, you know, I mean, the difference between one species and another and one genus and another is is difficult, um, and it's not it's not clear cut. It's often a, a kind of continuum. So while we put or we like to pigeonhole animals into different uh, categories, so species and genus and then family, often uh, two species in the in the same genus can be uh, relatively closely related or relatively distantly related, and it's quite difficult to tell. It's on a continuum. So in a roundabout, long-winded way. They couldn't interbreed with domestic dogs, but they do sh share the same suite of diseases. They get rabies, they get canine distemper, and contact with domestic dogs is extremely dangerous to wild dogs because they don't have the resistance that domestic dogs do to various diseases. Other thing I just wanted to say to finish the tooth discussion is we're often asked about milk teeth. And milk teeth, of course, apparently all mammals get milk teeth. And these chaps are no different, and I think you'll find that, you know, they've weaned now, so that those teeth that they have, although not very big yet, they are the, the, the adult teeth. Now, I cannot believe that no one else is coming to the sighting. It's absolute joy, and with any luck, we'll see them get up and go hunting sometime fairly soon. Now, Lily, you're just nine years old, and you've watched the Unkahuma Pride with a huge buffalo, and you wonder if this group of wild dogs could maybe take out a buffalo. Not that size, Lily. Now, it's difficult. Of course, I keep forgetting this. It's difficult to tell how big something is um, from just looking at your screen. Now, if you were to stand at nine years old, if you're an average size nine-year-old, if you were to stand next to those dogs there, they'd probably take you up to your tummy. So their shoulders would reach up to your tummy. And then if you were to stand next to one of those lions, you'd find it probably took you up to your head. Um, yeah, probably around your nose, actually. So they're very, very tall, the lions. They're much thicker and heavier. And these guys weigh probably about 30 kil kilograms, which is about 66 pounds or so. Lions weigh, those females that you were looking at there, probably about 120 kilograms. So that is about 260 pounds or so. So they're much, much, much bigger. 200 pounds difference between them. Look, 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 they're up. One of them's just, I know, Lily, this is going to be disgusting to you, but one of them has just vomited something up, and now they're all trying to share it. And I know that for a human being, that is a disgusting thought, but it does happen. So, Lily, they, they're just simply not big enough to take down a buffalo. The biggest thing that they could take down would probably be a pack this size. Um, if, let's say, they were all hunting, Lily, let's say all six of the youngsters were big enough to hunt and help on the hunt, the biggest thing they'd take down would probably be a, a wildebeest cow. And a wildebeest cow weighing in at probably around 180 or so kilograms, which if I multiply my maths, is a, it's difficult to do all this maths, almost 400 pounds. And a big buffalo bull weighs much, weighs about 2,000 pounds. And Angie, that dovetails nicely onto your question. What is the biggest animal they can take down? As a pack now with six adults and the six pups, I think you'll find the biggest thing they'll take out now would probably be a nyala, maybe a nyala cow, uh, maybe a nyala bull if they were very lucky. Uh, that's weighing in at about, um, if I don't remember incorrectly, a nyala bull weighs about 100 kilograms. Uh, so that's about 220, exactly 220 pounds. That's probably about the biggest for this pack. Um, but like I say, if they were all adults and all hunting, you'd probably push that to the size of a wildebeest. 
Now, Tracy, you've obviously just joined us, and it's great to have, thank you for your question. This pack is an interesting one. Now, I'm just quickly going to consult um, an update we had. One of the collared females is a, is a member of a pack called the Ingala pack. She's come away from there, and I'm just quickly looking here. The collared females, the males are from the Manyaleti pack. So it is a mixed pack, and I think that the pups were born to the Manyaleti pack. So I'm pretty sure that's what happened, and I think there are two members of the Ingala pack here, if I'm not mistaken. And there, just as the wind kind of dropped a little bit, and <laughs> this the smell, uh, and the, the sun came out, the smell of the dog sort of assailed our nostrils. Paul, yeah, it's a good question from you, Paul. How many packs are there in this area? At the moment, there are four. Now, that's four in the Sabi sand, which is 60,000 hectares, which is roughly times 2.4, Brian, takes us to roughly 160,000 hectares, at least acres or so, four packs. That is not the case. Sometimes, at least not the case always, sometimes there are four packs here, sometimes there are none, most often there are none. So they have huge home ranges of between 450 and 1,000 square kilometers. So that's between um, 600 square miles and all the way down to about 300 square miles, say, uh, probably around about the lower regions, about 300 square miles in this area. And they're not territorial, so they don't like to meet up with other dogs, and they can be quite um, uh, angry with each other. Sometimes there's a bit of a spat. But they don't mark a territory because the territory is, uh, the home range is so very big. And because they don't exclusively defend and mark a territory, it does sometimes happen that they all come together. And then, you know, the, the, point, the point of that at this time of the year is that this part of the Kruger Park, the western fringes, and specifically the northwestern Sabi sand, has received good rain compared with the rest of the Sabi sand. It's attracted a huge number of general game up here. Masses of water buck and four or five herds of wildebeest, which is unusual, thousands of impala, uh, lots of buffalo. And that means that the dogs are going to be, obviously, where the prey goes, the predators must follow. M. Ruth, why are they biting that one dog? They're just playing, Ruth. Um, they're just having a little bit of a, a play. Um, you know, I, I, I quite like to use this uh, this um, analogy, and I used to use it for our own dog, uh, Trubshaw. Uh, if you have what is called the law of the instrument, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem starts to look like a nail. Well, as far as it applies to dogs, um, if the only toy you have is your jaws, well, everything then starts to look like something to eat. And that's why dogs and cats use their jaws so much when they're playing. And, well, this one is building a sandcastle. You see that, Brian? That is very impressive. Digging a tunnel or making a fort, perhaps, underneath that fallen Cambritum tree. Gorgeous light now, everybody. Right, we're going to stay here. They seem to be getting a little bit more active. One of them's, uh, well, not to put too fine a point on it, he's going to the loo. So before you have to see that, let's head across to Taylor and some spiral horned kudu. Now we're just slowly going backwards because we've stumbled across three beautiful kudu bulls. And I want to try and get a view of them. They keep moving further and further into the thicket. But the light this afternoon is so spectacular. Okay, I think I've seen a gap. Let me just go a little bit further back. Awesome, I think we're gonna get one here. We're just heading towards a mitre drain. Oh, absolutely incredible, look at that. How beautiful is he with that light coming across onto his mane. I don't know if you call that a mane. David and I were discussing. And David says that you call a chest hair. <laughs> I don't know what else to call that. I would call it a mane. But isn't that beautiful? And that's also another indication you can tell 
the maturity of a kudu bull is you can look at this one now see how long it's got compared to the the gentleman that was in the middle who has got slightly shorter chest hair <laughs> kind of just stick with it today it's probably not called that i'm just being very silly and even looking at his shoulders did you see how he just stopped for a moment he heard something He's looking around with his eyes, he's listening, of course, with his ears. And he is beautiful, beautiful, massive neck on him. You can see those muscles developing on his shoulders. The kudu actually look fantastic considering the harsh conditions. But I, suppo I suppose that those new leaves came through on the trees a couple of weeks ago and quite early. So they possibly got a head start on some of the other animals that unfortunately are feeding on grass. We've even seen the Nyala and the bushbuck are looking in fantastic condition. So I suppose it's because of all that lovely lush vegetation. Now, at the moment, we're driving on Buffalo's Hook cut line and I'm planning on heading towards Buffalo's Hook Dam. We're gonna go and just have a look and see if there is anything interesting happening around there. So we're not too far. We're not far, are we, David? I think we've got a turn here, don't we? I think so. I keep forgetting. I don't know when I last drove on the cut line, the entire cut line. Here we go. We are, al we're al are almost here. We'll just go down this way. Are you sure, David? We're not going down Hyena Road now. Oh, we'll go on the fire break. Oh, the sneaky fire break. Yes, let's do that. And now I'm going to show you a couple of these a couple of these mud wallows as well that are drying out. Now, if you're wondering what on earth a fire break is, a fire break is a road, a road, in inverted commas, created, and it's really just seasonal. They normally do it just before the dry season hits, and they come through, and like you see, they create this road, and it's a divider. And essentially what will happen is that if the fire does come through, Theoretically, it should hit this fire break and it would have been cleared and you'd have vegetation on either side and it would stop the fire or slow the burning rate down, of course. Sometimes fire breaks don't always work though because if you have strong winds, they just blow straight over the top of the road and, and jump across. But you've got to do a fire break in conjunction with a burn on the reserve too. So depending on the areas and how sensitive they are, you should burn every three to five years or so. And when I say do a burn, it's a hot burn, so it's just a surface burn. You're not worrying about damaging the roots, so you do it on a, on a hot day with a breeze, and you'll burn that fire, and it moves quickly. It just burns the grass, it burns the leaves, but the trees will still survive, the grass will still survive. And essentially, in the rainy seasons, when you get enough rain, these fire breaks should grow again. There should be just lots and lots of grass on them and then you have to do them yearly. But I'm not sure how often they burn up here. Down in the south, goodness, we used to fight lots and lots of fires coming in from the Kruger. They don't do too much burning down in the Kruger. But when you've seen a couple of lodges almost burn down, you realize how important it can, it can be. And, and, and sadly, a lot of the fires that have started aren't necessarily just from sort of natural causes so something like lightning it could be from a piece of glass on the ground somebody throwing a cigarette bud that hasn't been put out and it catches maybe yellow thatching grass which is always typically dry and brittle and quite flammable something small like that could of course set a fire off now we're just about to arrive at Biffles Hook Dam and I wonder if there's any hippo here. Wouldn't it be nice if we could see those saddle build stalk again? That would, that's what I'm hoping for. We shall have a look in just a moment. Hmm. And I wonder what's happening with that buffalo carcass as well, if there's any vultures that have arrived on it. Oh, it looks like there is a hippo. Fantastic, let's get a nice view for you. I think this spot will do us just perfectly. Here we go. Hello, hippo. And I'm sure that our friend the hippopotamus will be much happier today. 
as it has not had to endure the blazing sun because again the cloud to heat ratio has been wonderful. Maybe this hippopotamus will get out of the water too and go for a little feed while we're here. It's lovely and cool. I almost feel like I could put a jersey on. It's cooling down quite nicely. Now, Michelle, you're wondering if we got any rain today. But unfortunately, we didn't. However, we were having a dispute in camp. As Kirsty said, we got some rain last night, but we're not sure if she was dreaming about it or not. <laughs> because no one else saw any rain. I didn't see any any puddles on the grain. Rebecca's just fed a question in my ear. Welcome back again, Rebecca. And she's also just said that Kirsty was definitely dreaming. It must have been a great dream, of course, if there was rain around here. But no, but we're building up to some rain. As you saw the big clouds are rolling in, the temperatures now dropped. We've had those excessive hot days. We're holding our thumbs for a thunderstorm. Last night we had a bit of lightning and we got a bit excited and we thought that the rain was going to come down, but sadly it didn't. But David says two days time, hey David? David says two days time and we know that he's down poor Dave. He knows exactly when the rain is going to come and I think he's the only person to predict rain in the world and be accurate. Let's have another look at our hippopotamus though. And quite content and I think we're going to start to see the behavior of these animals just become a little bit happy and a bit more pleasant because the grass is definitely starting to show but unfortunately for this hippo he's still having to travel quite a, quite a distance away from this water source to try and find food doesn't look like there's actually very much grass growing around at all around the pan. It's just a couple of sprigs that you can see here down in front of us, but not, not very much at all. You can see a little bit of a green patch, but that wouldn't unfortunately be enough for that hippo. And something that I also saw was that hippopotamus, this hippopotamus the other day, was eating dung and actually eating, eating rhinoceros feces and they'll eat buffalo feces and elephant feces especially the animals when the ones that they don't digest their food as well and i thought that was very very clever and it also just shows you how desperate these animals are of course getting that they have to resort to feeding on partially digested food i suppose though that's better than eating leaves, which your stomach is not able to digest as well. Now, you can really see how windy it is today, just by all the ripples on the water. So that's good. Let's hope it blows in the thunder, uh, the storm from, from the coast. It does look like the weather's actually coming from the east for a change. And I remember when I was guiding down in the south, and the wind came from the east and blew the weather in off the coast, we used to get these tropical thunderstorms, which was fantastic. And that would bring about the rain, the amount of rain that we really needed. But it doesn't seem as though there's too much else going on here at Wiffelsook Dam. So we'll continue on a little bit further. We'll do a couple of loops and let the guides come and have a look at the Unkahumas. And like I said, hopefully before the sun goes down, we'll be able to see another one. See if we can get a better angle now Paul you were you were commenting and saying that you think it's so hard to imagine that hippos are so dangerous let's see if we can get another shot here and I have to agree with you I think if you're if you're coming in and you're looking at something like a hippopotamus for the first time especially when they're sitting in the water like this so calm and so placid you can only wonder to yourself, how on earth are these creatures dangerous? I mean, look at them. They look fantastic. They look more pleasant than the lions. But of course, when you come between a hippo and water, that's when you're going to get yourself into a lot of trouble. Now, something has caught my attention, and we know that the smallest things catch my attention, but I've just spotted that buffalo carcass in the distance. And there's a big bird standing next to it. Now, I can't see what it is just yet. Perhaps a woolly-necked stork? It looks like it, doesn't it? I think we need to go over 
and investigate. What do you think, David? Let's go and see what's going on up ahead. Bye-bye, hippopotamus. Have a lovely evening. This is exciting. Now, I can already start to get smells from the carcass, which is my favorite, as you all know. And I believe that this morning there wasn't much happening. No signs of vultures. I believe it was just covered in maggots, in the flies' larvae. So we'll see. I don't want to get too close. I want to try and find a spot where we are not downwind. I'm really starting to smell it, so I don't. I should have brought a buff. A buff would have been a good idea. It's actually. I'm going to stop a little bit back because I don't want to scare this bird. How's that, David? Can you see it? That, that's probably as far as I can. There we go. And we have, of course, we've got a couple of branches in the way. I do apologise. But look at that. A woolly necked stalk and you can clearly see why it's called a woolly neck stalk because of that cotton sort of like fluff that they have on their necks and look at that big bill now I've never seen a woolly neck stalk feeding on a carcass before I've seen the marabou stalks I've seen southern ground hornbills feeding on carcasses so I'm not sure what this woolly necked stork is doing here. Maybe it's feeding on the maggots. But typically they eat fish and crustaceans and aquatic invertebrate. So I will have to just see. Maybe it's a new learning experience for all of us today. But it doesn't seem to be feeding at the moment. Just really grooming itself. But covered in maggots. Can you see that carcass is wriggling with life? Of course, we know it's not alive. That is just the flies that have laid their eggs. Sorry, I've just got a mouthful of this carcass, which is amazing. Just trying to compose myself. Now, this smell is becoming unbearable. I'm going to have to try and reposition. But we're going to hang around and see what this woolly neck stalk gets up to. But let's go back across to James, who's got those beautifully but sadly endangered species of animals. We're live. Okay, everybody. Welcome back to Cheetah Plains. The dogs have moved. The dogs have moved on account of a fact that a something resembling a combine harvester just drove past. It's been fixing some water hole here on Cheetah Plain. Anyway, it got the pups up, and now they're having a good time playing with each other and using their teeth again. You see that, Brian? Biting each other and, uh, well, stomping on each other. Now, what's interesting here is that this is how the hierarchy of the pack will be sorted out. This happens from very, very young. You'll find that the dog on the ground is probably going to be something like an Omega dog. In other words, it's going to be, um, well, not, not one of the dominants. And the one standing above it could easily become the dominant in its new pack. We'll probably remain in this pack. I mean, this pack's got some new blood in it now. And there are a couple coming past the front. Oh, this is wonderful. Let me just get out the way. Just starting to get active. One or two of the adults lifted their heads, but they're not sort of you know, particularly excited about getting anything going. Isn't that stunning? Look at them. <laughs> and I mean you can't really tell at this stage but they are substantially smaller than the adults probably but I'd say almost less than half the size wouldn't you so these little pups are roughly the size of let's say a I guess they're about as tall as um, I'm trying to think of a, a spaniel I guess a kind of spaniel sized with the adults are more German Shepherd or Alsatian sized. Now, we have a question coming through from Lys. Are the alpha pair the ones with the collars? Lys, as far as I know, I think it's quite randomly that they both have collars, uh, that there are two with collars. One comes from another pack called the Ingala pack. I'm not sure if it's that one or the other one. The other one, I think, is the male from the Manialetti pack. Now, whether he is the alpha or not, I don't know. It's highly unlikely that the female with the collar is um, an alpha. 
as if she's just joined the pack, it's much more likely that she's uh, quite the opposite. She's probably an Omega. <laughs> and then Brian to the left. Uh, you see, I mean, we've been asked all these questions about whether or not they're like domestic dogs or not. Well, these chaps have just watched a vehicle drive past and uh, a little bit like domestic dogs about to chase the postman. They've been quite interested in the spinning wheels. That's a little male you can see there. There we go. And as we watch them in the flush of their youth, they won't always be in the flush of youth, of course, and we were talking about the hierarchy. Hunter, you're wondering what's going to happen to them when they get a little bit older, and what happens if the alpha dies? Who chooses the next one? Well, dogs live, Hunter, in this area probably for not a great deal longer than five years. That's because life's pretty tough for them. Well, they potentially have a lifespan maybe of about 10, if they're very lucky. And then the next alpha or leader of the pack is decided by the next dominant one. So the males will have a hierarchy with a dominant at the top and or an alpha at the top and an omega at the bottom. And then there'll be a beta or beta or second in command. And he will then assume the role of the alpha after the if the alpha dies. That's normally what happens. That's, that's kind of a, a generalization. I think you'll find that, that probably uh, the method by which the new alpha is chosen is probably varies quite a lot. There might be a bit of a fight, because without the alpha's um, very obvious um, leadership, I think you'll find that there probably does change every so often. And if you do hear the pinging of the phone, everyone, that's just a comment or a communication from the final control coming through. I could make the phone silent, but then I wouldn't know what your questions were coming through, so I apologize for that. But we'll just have to deal with the odd ping. Ah, oh, very nice, eating a piece of charcoal. You see that, Brian? Obviously, there was a fire here a little while back, and that dog is cleaning his teeth and getting some minerals from some charcoal. How delicious. The light has just become quite a lot nicer as the sun's sort of come out a little as the clouds move in from the south. We're supposed to be having apparently a huge amount of rain in the next few weeks or few days or so. Uh, but we were supposed to have rain last night and we didn't have any. Oh, look at the light falling on them now. And so maybe these clouds will continue to break up and there will be that wonderful golden light on them now and possibly in the morning. Now, one of the big mysteries, of course, about why wild dogs are so endangered, well, is, you know, what kills them? Why, if they're such successful hunters, and there are very successful hunters, why are there not more of them? And, well, it's a complicated answer, but Joan, your question kind of dovetails quite nicely as to, uh, you know, as to what's going on uh, here. You say, do do any, are there, are there predators that, that eat wild dogs or that go for them? Lions account for an enormous number of wild dog deaths. Lions, of course, will kill all other predators if they can. The thought is that that is for competition, but, you know, I'm just not sure that I buy that because uh, there, I suppose you might describe a wild dog or a leopard as being a, a slight amount of competition to a lion, but they eat different things. You know, wild dogs don't eat buffalo in this area. They don't eat giraffe. They don't eat the big things like waterbuck. They hardly ever eat things like zebra. So I'm not sure I buy that. I just think it's the lions and other predators are predators and so they will kill whatever they can and sometimes perhaps they kill things that they don't think taste very nice I'm just not entirely convinced that they only kill um, for competition but lions certainly will kill wild dogs leopards I mean the most terrifying experience I ever had in the bush was with leopards and wild dogs leopards will try and if they know that there's a wild dog den they will often go and investigate it if the adults aren't there and if the adults are there that leopard can get in a into a huge amount of trouble. And certainly the one incident I had with a leopard on the front of the bond was directly caused by wild dogs trying to kill it. 
Now, off to the right-hand side, Brian, we've got some of the adults getting a little bit more active, starting to stretch and get up as that little one was eating the leaf, of course. And probably what they'll do is much like the lions, I guess, get up, have a yawn, have a stretch, lie down again. But we're getting to the time when they might go hunting. Remember, lions will hunt as it gets dark. And these chaps, just before it gets dark, the sun is dipping towards the west. It's a cloudy day. Um, <laughs> interesting, <laughs> interesting question from Mari. Um, you say, is there a wild dog that will protect the young? If a predator comes, I'm not really sure how to answer that. They are very defensive. They will definitely try and defend each other, absolutely. And they certainly always leave a nursemaid, Mari. And always leave a nursemaid with the youngsters when they're at the den site. So yes, from that point of view, they would defend them. The main defense of young wild dogs is to go down into the hole when they're at the den. Right now, though, they're, they are vulnerable. They're very vulnerable. These guys would definitely defend against a leopard, against a lion, they'd really struggle. Because lions, of course, are a huge amount bigger. And you know, hyenas, absolutely, they'd defend against. And we've seen them taking on hyenas and doing some serious damage to hyenas. They've all laying down again, as predicted, Brian. Sometimes it's nice when your predictions come true. Otherwise, sometimes it isn't because you really want them to go hunting. But they're so full-bellied, you know, I'm not sure they're going to do a huge amount of hunting today. There's that very obvious collar. Rob, your question is about how often it is that we see dogs with their pups. How common is that? Rob, it's um, the only time you see the pups, really. You don't often see... <laughs> The pups on their own and you know they're completely seasonal breeders I'm just going to answer both ways your questions your question could be interpreted they're completely seasonal breeders which means that they will give birth every year in the winter sometime in the winter time uh, because that's when it's easiest for them to hunt being coarsers it, the bush is more open and so it's easier for them to feed the pups during the winter time um, and so it's not uncommon if you're seeing wild dogs in the winter that you should find out where their den is or know where their den is and be able to see the pups with the adults that is very common for the winter time we haven't had a den on juma since i've been here i mean i've only been here now 18 months or so so two wild dog seasons but we haven't had any um we haven't had any dens here you haven't ever heard of a den on juma have you brian no. I think it has happened once or twice, but like I say, they roam so widely. We thought they might den last year, and they den just inside the Manuleti away from us. A different pack, not this pack. Manuleti is a reserve just to the north of where we are. All unfenced, of course. We're part of eight and a half million acres of contiguous wildlife land. That's three and a half million hectares. A vast, vast area. that light has faded again you can see the light gets flat and if those dogs were to go walking through this woodland now and there happened to be a steenbok or a diker or some impala or maybe a bushbuck uh, through there i think that'd be pretty difficult to see but the adults don't look like they're going nowhere and sandy no not quite um the dispersal of wild dogs is quite a difficult, it's an interesting one. It's not always very easy to describe. Look at that fat belly there. Sandy, you're wanting to know if it's males that always get kicked out in the same way that lions get kicked out of a pride. Normally, Sandy, no. The youngsters, probably from about two years old, will disperse in single sex groups. So the females from a litter will go off together, and then the males from that same litter will go off together, and they will then join up with males or females from other packs. So no, they disperse pretty much equally. I don't think, as far as I'm aware, that any dogs, I'm sure it has happened, but I don't think, as far as I'm aware, that any dogs stay within their natal pack for life. 
So that certainly is, would be extremely uncommon. Now they're all starting to settle down, except the three in front of us there. Brian, shall I move a bit, or are you happy here? I think we could probably manage here for now. I can't believe we're being able to... S I nearly didn't come here this today, everyone. I thought there were going to be so many vehicles coming, so I thought it would be terrible. But it's been marvellous. We've now been here oof, more than an hour. Brilliant. Even though they're snoozing, there's a little bit of action going on now. You see the ear, ear posture there? That's classic posture of an Omega dog. Also a dog who's just folded its ears by mistake. But I think that's pretty much, that's Omega behavior. And you must watch this with your own dogs. I'm sure many of you have got dogs and you'll take them to the park and they'll play with other dogs and they'll, you'll put, there, look at that. It's so clear. You'll be able to tell immediately if they are alpha dogs or if they're um, omega dogs because domestic dogs do exactly the same thing. They either feel dominant or they don't and that probably comes from their litter mates and I suspect they hold on to that kind of status for life. Now they're up. They're all up everybody. Here we go. Take your dentures out. Tip out whatever drinks you've got. Oh, I think the dogs are going on a hunt. This is marvellous. We've got something going on right behind us. I just don't want to run anyone over. The buffalo coming this way from the other side of Cheetah Plains there. Not Cheetah Plains and Coral. Watch this. Now, we can't cross this boundary, but the dogs can. <laughs> and I can't wait to see what those buffalo do. I'm just going to drive onto the road and then stop so that Brian's got a nice smooth shot. There you go, Brian. So this is as far as we can go, I'm afraid. But you see how quickly they got up? They don't mess around like lions do, taking ages to get up and decide what to do. Isn't that fantastic? There are the buffalo. Now, I mean, the chances of them killing a buffalo are negligible to zero, except that the buffalo, as we know, have been very, very weakened this year by the drought, and I'm pretty sure by tuberculosis as well. I still don't think these dogs are gonna take on a buffalo. Isn't that a beautiful shot, hey? <laughs> Look at that. You can put your dentures back in, everybody, if you want to. Brian, are yours back in? Mine are back in, Oh, yes. good, good, excellent. But I did waste my drink. You did waste your drink, yeah, I'm so sorry about that. Okay. I'll pour you another one oh, shortly. Thank you, thank you. Oh, what a wonderful shot. I'm just slightly sad the light has decided to desert us at this stage. Now, while the males, or the male went off towards them, I don't think he was ever particularly serious about trying to get hold of a buffalo. Um, behind him, the rest are looking around. Now, they get up very suddenly and they're going to make a hunting effort here. I don't think uh, with those buffalo, of course. <laughs> but I think they're going to try and hunt something. And the buffalo are doing that kind of... <laughs> how would we describe it, Brian? A kind of reluctant amble. No. <laughs> that's the boundary, isn't it? Or am I on the boundary? No, that's the boundary. We can go a few meters forward. <laughs> then we'll have to stop, I'm afraid. I'll just be, I'll check with Ryan. <laughs> right, another question coming through here. <laughs> no, no, that's a... Uh, serve a comment from Rebecca, which I shan't tell you about. Too nasty it was. Isn't it amazing, that hunting instinct? Now, we were talking a little bit earlier about the fact that, you know, the cats will kill other predators, which they do, of course, but it's just instinct. It's the instinct to hunt. 
Now, Sandra are the wild dogs your favorite in the bush. They are, you know. Sandra, it's because I am at heart a closet anthropomorphist. That means I really like to um, almost unconsciously put human emotions into animals. And wild dogs to me, um, well, they're exciting, but they also are very egalitarian. They look after each other. They s look after the sick and the lame and the infirm. They look after their old ones. They're completely unlike lions, of course, which are like, you know, they are so much the mafia of the bush. They don't look after each other. They'll kill each other at the drop of a hat. And then they pretend to be friends when they're hunting, of course, and then they try and eat together and they swat at each other and pull each other's fur and scratch each other. Whereas wild dogs are just not like that at all. And I just really like the fact that they live in an egalitarian society, a beautiful, beautifully coloured, and uh, there's always been something about a wolf to me, and these, of course, are the great wolves of Africa, and I would love to see a, a grey wolf one day, or a pack of them. Ever since I read the book White Fang, I'm sure many of you would have, would have read White Fang as youngsters. You read White Fang? You watched the movie. Oh. What was he? Uh, Rebecca says she also loved White Fang. I'm t she doesn't say whether it was the, the movie or the book. Sabrina, you're just 13, and I'm just going to get your question quickly. Oh, Sabrina, you say, I don't know which documentary this was, it's interesting. You say you've seen a documentary with where wild dogs try to raise a jackal pup. Um, Sabrina, I've not seen it. I don't know which one you're talking about, um, but uh, I've, I have heard of similar things happening. There's a, and I'm not sure it's not the same group of dogs. There's a group of dogs, or one dog, one female dog, who lives with a jackal, and well, I don't know if she still does, but she certainly used to. She lives with a jackal and its mate and their pups, and that's in, in, at Mombo in Botswana. And she used to go and hunt for them, basically. She used to look after them. The, the jackal would kind of help a little bit behind, and then she'd bring meat back for the adults and the pups to the den. And eventually, that little arrangement was a hyena female as well, and the hyena just used to sort of steal off the arrangement. But they'd all lie and rest together during the middle of the day around a termite mound where the little jackal puppies lived. And the jackal adults obviously a little bit weary of the hyena, but of the dogs, not of the dog, the single female dog, not in the slightest. And so, Sabrina, if it is a different documentary, then uh, I have heard of it happening, yeah. I don't know if it's happened once, I bet, over the course of evolutionary time, it's happened a hundred times. Now, this is a good direction they're heading. They're heading into Cheetah Plains. That is good news, because those buffalo are in Nkoro. No, right. okay, Brian, we got action. I'm going to move a little bit so we can watch them move. Starting to get a bit nippy out here, isn't it? So I think that's probably the alpha in front there, the alpha male. Definitely a male. So almost certainly the alpha male. Now, the rest of the pack will come up in the order, probably the alpha female behind. Let me just get me binoculars out. That'll be the alpha female. Yes, it is. And interest that's interesting. That's the collared female. So that's from the Ingala pack. The other collared one is a male. In fact, they're all... Okay, so they're... There are two females, one with a collar, one without. In fact, there are three. Sorry, I'm talking... No, I'm not talking nonsense. Two females, three males. And there come the little cups. Pups. Cups. <laughs> now, Tucker, you're just four years old watching with us, and it's so lovely to have you with us, Tucker. You say... Are, is the collar like the collar you would get on a puppy? Yes, it's exactly the same, except this one's very clever, Tucker. It sends information into space. 
And that information we can then get, well, we can't get it here, but there's a special fellow who can get it on his computer, and then he can tell exactly where these pups are all the time. So it's just the same. And just thinking about picking a direction of where to go and what to go for. There are dogs all over the Sabi sand at the moment, everyone. I keep getting little notifications here and there that there's a pack here, a pack there, here a pack, there a pack, everywhere. There we go, Brian, thank you, well done. <laughs> Not many of you would have got that, Brian, you know. You do have a rare talent for that sort of stuff. I'll do what I can. You do what you can. Wonderful to watch them play like this. I'm just putting my jacket on. Hope that the zip does up this time. <laughs> Many of you apparently keep looking at your own phones when you hear a ping because of mine pinging. I'm sorry about that. Uh, we're going to stay with these dogs. Let's see if they don't go off on the hunt. While we do that, Taylor's got something much larger to show you. We've come across two elephants. Now, you'll, have, you'll see them here. Oh, maybe there's more than two. I, I only just counted two just to begin with. We've got this female, and she's a little bit stressed. She showed a little bit of agitation with us, but, but now she seems to have settled down quite a bit. You can see that she's starting to feed. Let's see what she's going to do now. She comes out into the open. Hello, big girl. But you can see she's got swollen mammary, so I wonder if she's not perhaps a little bit stressed because she's got a calf on the way. I don't see any really small calves, but there's an, her older calf just to the left. You can see just feeding in the thicket. But much older calf, probably, well, maybe it's not even her calf, maybe it's a sibling or something, it's quite unusual, but We'll just keep our distance and you can see the Impala leaping across the road. I don't know what spooked them, but they're not alarming and doing particularly big leaps. Woo, wow, did you see that one? That was an incre... Oh, and another one, and another one. Try and get a screenshot of them and the elephant as they leap across the road. That could be quite spectacular. Come on, who's gonna do another massive leap? Rebecca says that the Impala are not jumping high enough. <laughs> there were one or two though that did a spectacular leap and I thought that that was extremely impressive and it really does just show you that they are the long distance jumping champions in Africa. Obviously I think that they are, but I'm also quite fond of Impala. Now I'm not sure if that's a sibling of hers, the one elephant on the, the right. It looks like it is a young bull that's, they're now disappearing. Let's, con let's go up towards them. Because the age gap sort of seems to be quite large there for it to maybe be her son. Maybe it was a young bull that's been slightly separated and now he's joined up with this female who seems to be traveling on her own, which is also quite unusual. But you know, in times of a drought like this, you tend to see some bizarre things like that woolly neck stork hanging around the carcass. No, I am wrong. I think the rest of the herd is up ahead. Aha, uh -huh. that's interesting. They're very quiet, but they're very, very far in the distance. So it must be just a little satellite party hanging at the back. Very sneaky, madam. So like I said, she wasn't too happy with us. So we'll try and maybe we'll actually try and head up ahead and find the rest of the herd. Let's see how this lovely boy is. Hello, are you relaxed with us? It's okay. He's a little bit nervous of us, but we will we'll just keep our distance. He seems to be relaxing now again, also going into feed. Now, Andrine and Marie, you are wondering if the drought will affect the coloring of the animal. Now, you're actually right, but I'm not sure in the way that you may think that you're right. And the reason how it affects the animals, not typically an elephant, but if you look at an impala or a kudu and even a buffalo, because they're not able to eat 
and get all the nutrition that they need. They are lacking sort of various minerals that will provide that lovely luster that they have on their coats. And their coats tend to become quite sort of shaggy and dull in color. So you're quite correct in saying that. But it's just because they're not getting the nutrients that they need. Now he's got rather large tusks considering the size of him. He doesn't look particularly old, probably around 10 or 11 years old. He's got lovely long tusks. But I've seen this before. He's not, like I say, he's not particularly large in size, so he could still grow quite, quite bigger, much bigger, sorry. But I've also seen it where you see these elephants that are much smaller in body size. They don't quite even get to five tons. They sort of get to the size of a large female. And then they, of course, have these massive tusks. And that, of course, is just genetics. Now, you heard that trumpet, that scream. And that sounded like a young elephant calf throwing a tantrum. Now, that was that young elephant bull, maybe responding to that youngster. You can see she's very relaxed, but he had his ears slightly flared, and as he moves away. But let's go up ahead. Let's go and find some elephants that don't seem to be, won't be too worried with us. There's a couple more just up in the road ahead. So hopefully we'll get another view. Now, as we were speaking about that young elephant's tusks and how impressive they were, so I just want you to turn the game drive radio down. David, you were wondering if an elephant's tusk can ever get so long that they touch the ground. They can indeed. I'm going to tell you a story now. Let's try and find some elephants to have a look at. Quite a few here, but they're in the thicket. Now, I think I also have a slow puncture, so I'm just watching my tire. Okay, I'm going to stop on a bit of an angle just because we've got a little gap. Now, there we go. Sorry, so David, to get back to your question about the elephant's sort of length of tusks and if they can reach the ground, have you, I wonder if any of you have ever heard of the Magnificent Seven. Now, if you haven't, this would be a good idea to jump onto the World Wide Web and perhaps type that in and you will see the most impressive elephants that ever roamed this greater Kruger area. Now they were believed to have had the mammoth gene in them because their tusks didn't curve like we typically see with the African elephant. They grew straight down towards the ground which was very typical of the woolly mammoths and they were ginormous. They weighed anywhere between six and seven tons. They were much larger than the normal big bulls that we get. But unfortunately, they are no longer around. As some of them were poached, some of them were hunted, some of them just died of old age. And there's a couple of museums that have their tusks in the various rest camps within the Kruger National Park. So if you ever come and visit, it'll be good having a look. I think if I'm not mistaken, Lataba is one area that has a museum that actually uh, showcases the beautiful tusks and of course a picture of uh, what some of those elephants look like. Now I've heard stories that up in the northern areas of Kruger where there are no roads, they're completely untouched areas, you can go in on foot and even then it's restricted to just sort of researchers they say that they've seen some young bulls with massive tusks that they think carry that Magnificent Seven gene, which is very exciting. But, of course, we're not looking at one of the elephants that belong in the Magnificent Seven at the moment. We're looking at a lovely elephant and her calf. And they look like ordinary elephants, but an ordinary elephant is pretty spectacular as it is. Now, Gareth, Welcome, I believe you've just started watching, so it's great to hear from you and keep asking those questions. Now, you were wondering how many elephant bulls do we have in the area? Now, unfortunately, that's a tough one to try and answer, as typically a herd of elephants is made up of females. So it's a matriarchal cycle, so it's a, sorry, system. So it's elephants that are either mothers or granddaughters or sisters or aunts, you name it. They're closely related. and. 
the bulls get kicked out of the herd, so they don't stay in them for very long, normally up to about between 16 and 18 years. They then get sort of said to cheerio, off you go, and live a life on your own. I'm just going to move up again and see if we can get another view. So it's quite difficult to say. I don't even feel comfortable with trying to estimate a number, but there's quite a few thousand elephants in this greater Kruger area. Remember, there's eight and a half million acres of wilderness. And uh, the last statistic I read, that just for the Sabi sand, which is about 135,000 acres of land, but we're all open to the greater, to the Kruger National Park, and we're incorporated in the greater Kruger area. But the last census I read, I think it was for 2015, it must have been last year's one, they estimated us to have about 6,000 elephants. Now that is a huge number or such a small piece of land. When I say small, it's really massive. But of course, elephants are giant creatures, and they need to feed and eat at least 5% of their body weight every single day. So you can imagine, like this elephant is doing, is munching away, and it needs to do that for 19 hours a day. So when you start saying these p sizes of the land, with the amount of elephants that are on 135,000 acres, wow. That's really not a lot, and they'll go through the food very quickly, and that's why we start to see them pushing over the trees, is that when they've exhausted all the grass, exhausted all the leaves in the drier months, they've got to start, and, and they become sort of destructive. They've, they've got to start turning the trees over to eat the roots, like what I think this elephant is going to try and do. So, very different, difficult question to answer how many elephant bulls. Lots, lots and lots and lots of them. At one point, they were even taking some of the elephant bulls out of their greater Kruger area and relocating them to places all over Africa, just because there were too many of them. And it's easier to remove the bulls rather than to try and remove an entire family group of elephants. This little one is struggling though with breaking this tree. But you can see now how he's going to use his feet, there we go, and hook it and then pull it straight out of the ground. Now watch how he's going to pop the bottom end of that tree into his mouth. Eh, wonderful. And this is quite nice to see as well, is the twisting motion, the sort of corkscrew action that you can see him doing to twist the bark off. That was a fantastic example. And now he's going to munch on, on that. And the layer that they're going for is even though this one took in the outer layer, it's not as coarse and hard like you see on a, a marula tree, for example. It's quite thin, that outer layer. But essentially, like you most of you have known, but there are quite a few new viewers today, so we'll just recap so they can all catch up, is they go after the cambium layer. So you can see where that yellowish flesh is explo exposed. They're going for the layer just above that, which the elephant is now stripping off. And that is where the nutrients are transported from the roots all the way to the leaves. And that's got lots of moisture and, of course, whatever specific minerals each tree has. And we typically see them doing that in the drier seasons. Doesn't seem to be too fond, though, of the monkey orange leaves much more preferring the bark. That's okay. And there's a couple of roots on the end, which should be, should be quite juicy as well. So we'll see if he gets to them at the end. Now, Hunter, you were wondering if it was true or not, if an elephant uses their trunk like a, a sensor, and you're definitely right. They've got an incredible sense of smell, and the tip of their trunk is very sensitive. You see, there we go. Just how this elephant is sort of popping its, uh, its trunk over the top of that branch, seeing if there's perhaps another juicy bit that it missed. So you're quite right. I think they can... Pick, they pick up vibrations in their feet, of course, but I wonder if they're able to sense through their trunk and sort of feel things as well. They've also got lots of little uh, hairs, quite sort of tough bristles around the trunk, and they'll be quite sensitive too. 
When you even see them eating from a thorn tree, you see how delicate they are. And be careful not to prick themselves, of course, on the thorns. But I did just also get the go-ahead. I'm quite excited is that they've said that we can come back to the lion sighting, to go back to the Nkuhumas. Now, I'm sure you are very, very excited to do that. So I don't want to waste too much time. I think we're going to start heading that way. Gareth, I'm glad that uh, you were happy with my answer. <laughs> Some, it's difficult to know everything out here, so we just guess, especially when it comes to sort of the numbers and uh, the densities of animals, because they've got such a big area. But I'm glad, keep on watching, keep lots, asking lots of questions. It's a great platform to learn new things. Not just you learning every single day, but, but even us out here in the bush. Now we're gonna start making our way back down towards where those lions were and uh, go in and have a look. And it's actually getting very chilly. David has just put his jacket on. I'm going to have to do that at some point too. David, look at those clouds. They're getting dark now, don't you think? As we're driving along, bumbling. Definitely the clouds have dropped quite a bit. They're not sitting as high in the sky as they were. And obviously that's also an indication to us when, when we think we're gonna get rain is if the clouds are too high, well then, no need to worry but they've come in very quickly from the east so you, we're gonna have to watch out for these of course you know we've got all this fancy equipment and we don't want to get it wet so keep your fingers crossed though and hope that literally at seven o'clock just as we finish the show it starts to pour with rain that's what I'm hoping but it seems as though we've got two buffalo up ahead so the lions will just have to wait a little bit longer I also want to just turn the radio up. We want to hear what's going on. Hello, Buffalo. You two are not looking very well, I'm afraid. Hello, girl. Now you can see this is a buffalo cow that we've now spotted. And they're very typical, pointing the nose to the sky and looking towards us. And even though she's thin, her coat doesn't look too bad. You can see her ribs, obviously, and her hips sticking out. But her nose is lovely and shiny and wet, which we know is a good thing. Very much like your pets at home. I'm sure you look at your cat and your dog's nose quite often to see if they're well or not. And of course, when you know it's dry and crusty, that they're feeling a bit under the weather. Now this buffalo is looking a bit worse than the cow did. You can definitely see a difference. And this looks like a, a young bull and he's covered in mud. He was obviously trying to cool down earlier today. And it's sad, it seems as though they go towards the water and spend a bit of time down there. Now, I believe that those wild dogs have, are up and moving around, which is very exciting. So let's not waste too much time here. Let's go back over to Cheetah Plains and have another look. We're live, everybody, we're live. Hello, I'm um, sorry, a little bit uh, <laughs> discombobulated. Rebecca, try the radio now, we might get you in this area. The dogs have be just got up and they've started running down this way and we're about to head into the clearings beyond which is Mala Mala. So I'm not sure how long we're going to be able to stay with them. And for those of you who are perhaps new viewers, uh, the animals can come and go from the properties that we're on as they please. We can't. We have our unfortunate human property laws that we have to look after. The adults are in front here. Here come the pups behind us. We'll just have a quick look at them and then I'm going to move quite quickly to the adults because we want to be with the adults. This is what happens when they're on the hunt. The pups, of course, get distracted. They're so cute. And they will hang back now. He's just picked up a nicer... <laughs> Brian, the one at the back, picked up the stick to carry. There we go. He's got his toy. Wonderful stuff. And the smell, i got to tell you, look, I know smelly dog is a horrible smell if you're in the home, but out here, it's just the smell of excitement. Oh, this is just fantastic. So the adults still up in front, don't worry about them. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on them while Brian <laughs> shows you this rather fascinating behavior, piece of bark being torn to shreds which of course is going to happen to whatever they catch for dinner. 
I think there's often a, a bit of a thought that uh, wild dogs are merciless killers of animals and that they don't, um, they don't kill their prey first and so they're much crueler. Anyone who's been watching the Nguhuma Pride of late will know that that just simply isn't the case, that death to wild dog prey comes a huge amount faster than it comes to the buffalo. They struggle and struggle and struggle. Good, well things have calmed down a little now. I'm just rather wishing that we had a little bit more prey activity. And of course they're heading perfectly into the wind. Now whether that is by design or not, I'm not sure. Some people will tell you that these predators know which way the wind blowing is blowing and they take cognizance of it, knowing that their prey can smell them. I think with dogs that might be the truth. With lions, it's been shown to be fairly random, and I think that's because lions don't smell very strong. Certainly, I mean, I couldn't tell you what a lion smelt like. Could you, Brian? Can you think of a lion smell? I don't know. No, I can't. Right, here we go. We want them to come up this way. We don't want them rushing off towards Mala Mala. Yeah, that's an interesting one from Jackie, of course, we're continuing the theme of comparing them with domestic dogs. Jackie, you say that they wag their tails when they're happy. I'm just trying to think. Yeah, they do. They definitely wag their tails when they're happy. I don't think quite as obviously as uh, domestic dogs do, but there does seem to be a fair amount of tail wagging when they're feeling joyful about life. When they're approaching each other, though, they tend to put the tail down if they're not dominant if they're omega and if they're dominant if they're alpha uh, the tail tends to be sort of stuck straight out behind them mm, the smell is quite strong oh here we go Grabbed a little piece of a broken down Zizifus there. Might have it actually attached to its lip because that thing is a thorny branch. It's knob thorn actually. <laughs> okay, the adults are moving off to the side now. See that, Brian? They've gone through the woodland. Now the little ones not moving with them, mainly because I don't think they've realized that they've been left behind just yet. I'm going to go around them. Oops. Simply because I do not want to lose those adults. If they go herring after something now, oh. Brian, can you see them at all? Everyone, we're going to leave the little pups for now. No, there, I can see them. They are through there. Yeah, the pups are now going to follow the adults. Um, now, there's a, there, we have two choices. One, we go after them. They're going north again. <laughs> so I think we're going to have to head in. Are you going to go around? Okay. Brian, at least um, Ryan from Arethusa is going to go around to the other side there, and I think that's the best approach because I'm not sure. <laughs> Come on, Wendy. Come on, baby. Let's go. Did I just say that, Brian? Did I just call Wendy baby? All right, hold on, everybody. I'm going to try and keep my distance. We're going to try and do this as sensitively as possible. They headed off left and right, as far as I can tell. Watch your heads, everyone. Um, and Ryan has gone around to the clearing, so he might be able to see them. I can still see them. There we go. I'm just going to quickly try and find the radio. Try not to break the car. It's important not to break the car, Brian. Yes. Try not to use the cameraman, who's obviously not a small fellow. Ryan, they're going due east through this block. 
try and find some questions to answer on my telephone. If I'm not answering questions, everybody, um, if you lose them, we can link to Taylor. She's ready. Okay, right, we're going to try and stay with them for a second. Just quickly try again. All right, I think it's going to get quite hairy in here, everybody. Let's head back to Taylor. I think she's back with the lions, and I will try and keep up with these chaps and keep you posted when you come back. We're not quite there yet. Now, there you go. A zebra just bolted into the distance. My goodness, why are you running away from us like that? Here it is. No, now it's stopping. Maybe we just gave it a little bit of a fright. But we're not going to stick too long with these zebra. The reason being is because we don't have uh, really a sun this evening because the clouds are so thick. It's going to limit our time with the Nkuhumas. So we want to go around and try and get there as quick as possible. And we're not too far away now. We're a wee distance away, but we'll, we'll hopefully try and catch up. Ooh, a little bumpy bump. And, um, and then we'll get there. We're, we're basically we're on Mumba. I think we're on Mumba. We're on Twin Dams now, aren't we? Here we go. So we're on Twin Dams. We won't be there. It won't take us too much longer. We'll just bounce around a little bit. So just bear with me as we head on over. Vroom. And I wonder what they're up to now. Hopefully they've started eating. That would be quite exciting, I think. Right. I wonder where Karula is as well. That was something I've been thinking about the entire time, is wondering where she is and where she's disappeared to be. Obviously had her tracks earlier this morning, and we know that she doesn't bring those little cubs over for no reason, so she must have a kill somewhere in the drainage line. But it's just becoming more and more difficult now to spot kills from the road with all the vegetation greening up. Uh, as the as the rainy season comes into play but that means we've got to do a lot more walking of course and then getting off of the vehicle and I don't know about anybody else I'm a little bit nervous still of the buffalo after my buffalo incident so I'm always quite cautious and uh, well we know how much the buffalo love drainage lines so hopefully tomorrow morning, if they have gone to drink, we will, if then they've come out of a drainage line, hopefully we'll see their tracks uh, crossing on the road. I'm not sure if uh, Aubrey or anyone went to go and have a look and see if they could find anything on those tracks, but I'm sure after this afternoon having a great lion sighting, that's probably, well, what we'll be doing and looking for in the morning. Good evening. They're having a sundowner, but I suppose you can't call it a sundowner this evening. It's more of a cloud downer. And that's one of the fun things that you get to do when you go on safari, is stop and stretch your legs and eat lots and lots of snacks and, uh, and drink a variety of beverages. Now, I don't know if any of you watching have ever been on safari before. Oh, what? Okay, I'll get back to that story. Let's go to James, who's back with the dogs. We live. Okay, everybody. They're on the hunt. They're in parlor in front of them. They are heading straight for the Kruger Park, though. Brian and I had quite a time getting through there. Brian's instinct was exactly correct. He knew exactly where they were coming. Now look, they're in the stalking mode. The Impala have seen them, but that doesn't matter. Here we go. Doesn't matter that the Impala have seen them. They're alarming, and now they're off. Here we go. Okay, now we're going to stay relatively close behind them, but if they go into thick stuff, everyone, well, we need to follow, hopefully, the Alpha. He's headed off straight through there, in front of us. Now they're slowing down. I'm going to cut the engine here just so that I don't, we don't rev them. The little ones, very cute, running behind, and they're wonderfully running straight back in toward, into Cheetah Plains. I'm gonna cut the engine again, again, I'm not gonna make too much noise. The little pups are off to the left-hand side, trying desperately to keep up, failing at this stage, but they'll catch up if there's a kill. 
We're just going to, we're going to push straight through this open area. Ryan's going around the other side. They went straight into the thick stuff here. Now we're going to have to be a little bit careful, try and stay a little bit further behind. There, 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 there. Off to the left, Brian. I think there's an adult there. They don't look like they've killed, though. I'm going to turn off so that they can talk to each other. I'm not going to make a noise now. We're just going to wait and see. Oh, they're all there. They're all there. The whole, whole, the whole pack. They're still chasing. Going due, uh, Ryan. They're going straight west. I think they've cornered something in here. I think they've cornered something in here, everybody. The pack is now all heading southeast towards the first clearings where we were. It looks to me like, they just look like they may have surrounded something. I'm sorry if you're sending through questions, everybody, but to, if I look at my phone now, we're definitely going to have an accident. Yeah, Ryan, we've got visual. They're heading now straight back towards Cheetah Plains Pan. They're about to pop into the clearing there. This is just too exciting for words. Isn't it wonderful? You're right there, Brian. Okay, we're going to switch off again, let them listen. So those Impala, the luckiest Impala in the Sabi sand tonight, They've got away from the lion, the wild dogs and the lions, obviously. Isn't this special? It's just so gorgeous. Now, interestingly, they will tell you that wild dogs are the most efficient hunters, that they will kill eight out of ten times that they chase. Well, they don't tell you, though, is that they don't often push through on the, their attacks. And it means that if about they probably only kill three out of 10 times they see something and decide to see if they're gonna chase it or not. What they don't do, similarly to other animals, what they seem to work out much more quickly is whether or not they're gonna catch an animal. And so if they're not gonna catch, they just stop and then they try again something else. And so that would be classified, I guess, as a failure. Ryan, come in. Ryan, um, they haven't gone out into the clearings. They're now static, just on the eastern fringe of that clearing. We found something in there, probably a few beetles. Yeah, you'll get them now to your north. Phew! Isn't that fun? <laughs> Let me just get a little bit forward and get the whole pack in view. so cool. Now, I suspected this might happen, you know. They've eaten so much today, well, just from, I don't know what they've eaten, but they had such big fat bellies. They still do. No, there's no problem, right? No problem at all. Um, and I thought, yes, they might try and hunt, but then I thought maybe they wouldn't be that enthusiastic about it. And as darkness falls, of course, they will probably just settle for the night. Have they've had their kind of exercise, they've done a bit of a run. They've probably run, let me work it out for you. They've gone down there, through there, and up and around. Not much more than one and a half kilometers, to maybe two kilometers, around about a mile and a bit. <laughs> Slug. A wonderful question from someone called Slug. Thank you, Slug, that's a very, um, what shall we say, a short and sweet Twitter handle, very evocative. Slug, you say, do they have some kind of uh, formation when they hunt? Other than the alpha male leading the hunt, no, they don't really. Uh, for many years we thought that there was some kind of coordinated attack, but research done on dogs, especially collared dogs and dogs with um, subcutaneous chips, 
shows that the running is actually fairly random. So they saw that herd of, of Impala. The Alpha picked one, uh, one or two got distracted by the others, and the pups just kind of ran in from behind. And apparently they get distracted very easily when they're on the hunt. And so, no, there's no real sort of formation other than the alpha male and the female, alpha female leading the hunt as it starts. But as it then progresses, no, nah, there's not really a huge, there's not really a huge amount of coordination. Now, let me just describe the atmosphere to you slightly. It's, well, there's a, obviously there's the niff of wet, damp dog in the air, uh, but it's quite a fresh, watery sort of a smell on the back end or front end of this, of, on the front end of this cold front. The air is almost free of dust. And the atmosphere is charged now, of course, because of these dogs, but it's now starting to really kind of calm. And I don't think these dogs are gonna do much else. And the other thing is that we have to pull out now because it's starting to get dark. So we'll sit here for another two minutes. We will not put light on them. And Paul, you say, is beautiful comment for this, t for what's happened here. You say they go from attack to relax very quickly. They do. And they did exactly the opposite when they got up, of course. They went from, complete relax to chasing buffalo in the matter of about, well, I don't know, three and a half microseconds. Just gorgeous stuff. I can't believe we've had so long with them today. If anything comes past here, they'll almost certainly grab it. But I think they're probably gonna head into some thick bush where they will rest for the night. And of course they don't, they won't sleep as soundly as they did during the day. The night time, of course, for wild dogs, the most dangerous time. They're not nocturnal. It's the time when the lions and the hyenas move and the leopards. And so these guys will have to remain pretty kind of, uh, pretty aware of what's going on throughout the night. All right, this is going to be the end of the wild dogs, everybody. Say goodbye to this magnificent pack. We will, with any luck, see them again maybe tomorrow. I suspect they'll be gone by the time we can get to Cheetah Plains in the dawn light. But let's see, we might be lucky. So from the wild dogs of Cheetah Plains, goodbye. <laughs>
and you can even see how thick it is. Look at how incredible that is. That's a couple of, you know, maybe an inch or two thick. Or maybe not even that much, but it's 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 pretty it's pretty thick. At probably about two centimeters or so. And then you can see the stomach. Then that's just the the stomach, um, the outside layer. And I wonder if their next move is going to be to pierce through that now that there's a big hole. Now, Gareth, it's great to hear from you again. And I'm so glad that you've got into asking all these questions. Now, you'd like to know, in my experience, if the Nkuhumas are very, you know, specifically specialists in hunting buffaloes, because they are indeed successful, like you mentioned. Oh, let's just quickly go back here. I just want to watch this little cub as it uh, growls around. Now, I, I, I agree with your statement, and, and in my experience, they are very, very successful. Oh, look at this cub now climbing on top of the buffalo. Gareth, I'll get back to your question. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten. Now, there's obviously not a lot of room where everybody else is sitting on the edge of the buffalo. So the only other option is, well, to go and climb on top of it. But unfortunately, that didn't last for long. So let me get back to your question quickly then, uh, Gareth. So... It's typically in the winter months when the buffalo or the dry season, it's referred to it as the dry and the wet season. So we get our rain in the summer. So normally from early spring, from September right through up until about February, February, we can get rain. And then in the dry season coming into autumn and the winter months, we don't usually have any. Oh, a little bit of a dispute there. You can see the, the, the sort of, not jealousy, that's the wrong word that I wanted to use there, of course. Um, but getting a bit antsy with that other cub getting too close. Now, in these drier seasons, these buffalo are so weak. We saw earlier how you could see their ribs, how you could see their hips. They're not in great condition. So yes, now they're taking as many as they can, but it's going to change. As we come into summer, the buffalo are going to be stronger. They're going to be a lot more difficult to take down. So we may start seeing the lions feeding on things like impala lambs it wouldn't be uh, and not common it, same thing with warthog piglets they'll they'll start to take them we saw that a lot last year as well as taking things down like kudu kudu often form a large sort of uh, part of the lion's diet but it all really just depends Now, looking at this carcass, and, and looking at the carcass that we saw earlier that was covered in, in maggots quite close to uh, Buffalsook Dam, Samantha, you were wondering how long does a carcass take before it becomes spoiled and can no longer be eaten? Now, the answer to that is never. It never becomes, never gets to the point where nothing will feast on it. So even a lion, at the moment the lions are spoiled though, because there is an abundance of food around, that they are able to be picky and we clearly saw this a couple of weeks ago about two or three weeks ago where the lions came across a carcass it was riddled with maggots like the one we just saw they sort of tugged on it a little bit then they moved on then we came and walked through uh, went through a thick uh, bit of vegetation they came across a buffalo that had been stabbed by another buffalo and was dying because of those injuries he was bleeding out essentially they also tugged on him and then they heard the distress calls of, I think it was two females and one of the Birmingham boys taking down a buffalo and it was, it was distressing. They then left that second buffalo and went to the young calf which the others had caught and they'd fed on those. They didn't go back to the other two carcasses. How incredible is that? But that's only because of this, this period where there's an abundance of food around. In the summer months, I can guarantee that that would have gone completely different they would have feasted. They either would have gone to the buffalo that was being taken down and they would have come back and feasted on the others. Now, can you hear that? Now, that's her using the carnassial shear. So that's her scissoring with her teeth, trying to either cut through the flesh to get into the, the the better parts to feed on 
Or what she could also be doing is this is normally when it gets to the end of a buffalo carcass and there isn't much meat, is they try and remove the bits, the chunks of flesh from the skin and they often do the carnassial shear is what it's called. But Samantha, just to get back to your question, they will eat rotting meat, the vultures, the hyenas, the lions, the jackals. The only one that might be a little bit reluctant to feast upon a rotting carcass is a cheetah. But even then, I can promise you, if that cheetah is starving and there's nothing else for it to eat, it's not going to say no to a carcass. There we go. It seems as though she was successful and she's managed to get through to the hi uh, through the hide now and, and, and feasting on the rump, which is one of the first areas that they normally start eating at. And of course, that young cub is taking full advantage and obviously learning as well from that lioness on how to do the carnassial shell and developing its own technique to get into inside the carcass. And then if we look on the left, we've got another young cub who's biting around the joint of where the elbow, I suppose, would be on the buffalo and trying to tear into the flesh from that end but struggling as you can see fighting with the carcass you can even see where they've been chewing on the poor buffalo's ear at one point you can just see how the the hair has been removed there we go they were chewing on that at some point i don't know if i'd like can you can, can you zoom in anymore is that it david look at can you see the ticks inside his ear it's quite difficult to see but i don't know if you can maybe see it but there's actually it's in ear is completely infested with ticks that is terrible those big lumps inside there my goodness I'm glad that we don't get ticks deep down inside our ear like that that wouldn't be very pleasant now I'm sure a few, I'm sure a few of you are wondering if those ticks have arrived now or were they there on the buffalo before it uh, passed on and it's actually very healthy for animals to have tick populations living on them you will, won't find an unhealthy animal with very many ticks and of course like humans and we often hear and we see on our cats and dogs as well if you're living out in the wilderness whenever you go and you go into the bushes the doctor always says to you you must remember to check for ticks when you've come back sort of behind your legs behind your knee to check around your ankles, to check in any warm area, so your groin underneath your arms. And it's the same with the animals. The ticks like to go to the warm and the moist places, so between the back legs, underneath any folds of skin, so between their sort of their legs and their chest, in their ears, under their neck. You can see them all, they've congregated over there. So it's the same thing for the animals. So even though this buffalo was on the thin side, it obviously wasn't too sick uh, that the ticks obviously needed to uh, leave the buffalo. Normally when you see that they've got diseases and things, they'll have very, very, very few ticks on them. Now it's getting to the point where it's getting quite dark now, and you can see there's a little bit of light that I've put onto the lines, but I've, what I've done is I've put one of the LED lights on, so I'm not shining the spotlight. So it's not one direct source of light, and I'm not shining directly on them. It's bouncing off the ground, and those rays are spread quite a bit, but we won't stay here for too long. And this is a personal opinion, because none of these cubs, is, well, there's only one set of cubs that are six months old. The rest of them are still too young, and we generally don't spot on them with a proper spotlight until they're about six months. And one of the reasons is, is that sometimes this light can draw and attract predators or highlight the predators and I would hate if a clan of hyena came through here with these young cubs and you know we were of course going to be the reason that these cubs were spotted so that's one of the reasons why we don't shine a spotlight on young animals you'll see often with leopards if they if they're young leopard cubs and the cub uh, and the kill is on the ground mo a lot of guides won't actually spot on the kill but if it's hoisted, it obviously it's a different story because a hyena can't climb up a tree. We know how hyenas like to follow leopards and lions around, of course. So I think we're going to just have a little longer look for a couple of minutes, but then we are going to move away and leave these Incahumas.
but for now it's all right it's it's still it's still relatively light it's obviously just because the clouds have come over you can see ooh it's the two cubs having an argument about who gets to feast on the best spot But like I said, for now it's all right. We've got a couple more minutes that we can hang around with them for before the sun actually completely disappears and we lose all the light. I can see, uh, what I'd normally try and do is I normally try and gauge it on my eyesight. If I can see about 50 meters into the distance, then I reckon it's still okay. But as soon as I can't see further than that, then I think that it's uh, the time to leave them until these Inkahumas are a little bit older. But like I said, that's just a personal preference. We're all different. You can see that lion cub's actually struggling a little bit. There's a, there is a small hole from where they removed the sensitive bits of that buffalo. But it's, buffalo's foot is in the way, and every now and then you see, ooh, it getting squashed. Now, Carrie, you were wondering if it would be easier for these lions just to claw straight through the buffalo, and unfortunately not. So their claws are designed for gripping and holding on nice and tight. But they haven't got strong claws like you see on a cheetah or on a wild dog or a hyena or anything that would use their claws to dig. You see them, they, they are able to retract their claws and protect them. So they won't, they're not strong enough at all to dig through that hide. That hide is so tough. So the easiest way is to gnaw through the hide and make a little incision and then of course tear it open from from that and and I reckon by tomorrow morning they would have opened up this carcass especially once Mr. Mfumo decides to come around and have a, a bite to eat but he doesn't seem to be too interested at the moment I think what we do, are going to do is we're actually going to move forward I'm going to leave these lions and the cubs eat but I think we can go up ahead and spotlight the other adults because they don't seem to have any cubs around I'm just it's now getting very dark all of a sudden so let's just move forward but thank you guys, we'll try and get to you in the morning. Right, let's go see what Stim Fumo is up to. You can see his head is down, let's put some lights on. Where's my spotlight? My spotlight is here. Some of the cubs are fast asleep, they're not interested at all. They must have had a very busy day. I'm actually going to... I'm going to do this. Hello guys. Oh, no, sorry, my bad. I thought I put it in neutral. I obviously didn't. <laughs> sorry, David. <laughs> now, even with the adults, I actually haven't even bothered. I'm just going to adjust the LED light. I haven't even bothered with the spotlight. Just because we're relatively, uh, relatively close proximity. And I find that these LEDs work really nicely and they're not as harsh on the animals. Now I know you, some of you haven't ever been on a safari, but um, when we shine the spotlight, we don't actually shine directly into the animal's eyes. We shine on somewhere else on the body to illuminate the face. Because you can imagine if you were, sh first, if you were to shine these spotlights, which have got quite a few lumens, it would, it would actually hurt their eyes too. So something like this, these LEDs really come in handy where they're a lot less harsh. Now he's getting up. Let's see what he's going to do. And I also find that these LEDs cast some nice shadows. I know Rebecca just said they look beautiful. So you'll see me just every now and then turning the LED. But he looks very interested in this female. Who are we? Who are we over here? Now he's Fleming grimacing. He, he did test her to try and pick up her scent. Now what's the verdict, mister? She doesn't look very impressed by um, that notion. Perhaps you need to tread cautiously in Fumo. Miki's brain is working overtime now as he tries to think about his next move. But first, a big stretch.
And he's rubbing up against the tree, which is typical of this male. And as he turns his tail up and he sprays the urine, we definitely know that he's marking his territory. Hello, big boy. And now he's just going to sit back down and perhaps have a nap again. Yes, that's exactly what he's doing. Now, I don't know where the Birminghams have come from, where him and Mr. Tino had walked from, because I don't think they were on... Who? I wonder who was here last night. David, you and Jamie had a male line. Who was it? I'm not sure. I can't remember who exactly was... Uh, David seems to think it was maybe Tino. Oh, there we go. You were spot on. It was indeed Tino that Jamie and David had last night. But Mr. Mfumo wasn't around, as, as far as I'm aware, so... I wonder where he's come from. And it's nice to see, though, that these boys are out and expanding their territories. Because when I got here, I, we, I only saw them with the Nkuhumas. And I think that they re realized, oh, we actually have to go out and do a bit of work and go out and mark our territories if we want to keep this area. Big arguments going on back at the carcass, but it sounds like it's just the, the little ones fighting again. And it's going to get worse and worse as they age. And maybe that's why these lionesses are taking a bit of a break. Maybe they're just like, no, we don't need that in our lives anymore. We'd rather go and feast when the little ones have got a full belly and they can sort of eat in peace. Because every time we've seen any arguments happen around the carcass, they always seem to be instigated by the young Ngahuma cubs. Can you hear all that noise going on at the back? Now, of course, they've gone quiet. Isn't this lovely? But it looks like these lions, unfortunately, are going to rest for a little while longer. So what I would really, really like to do, I'm just trying to look for all my goodies down here. I would really like to move on from these lions now. I think we've had fantastic time with them. And let's go see if we can find anything interesting that's lurking around after dark. Now, I'm just saying, I'm just trying to rearrange a couple of things. I've got wires hooking on wires, and I want my I want my spotlight cable to come out a bit further. There we go. That's now I'm a little bit more organized. But thank you, Nkuhumas. It's been wonderful. Let's turn the lights on. And let's go see what else we can find. Bye-bye, guys. But we'll be back tomorrow to have a look. Oh, wonderful. So I believe that James has made the long journey back from Cheetah Plains. Let's go see what he's going to be looking for now. At the moment, everybody, I have indeed returned from Cheetah Plains, and what we've got is, the, remember the wildebeest we started the show with? Well, they're all in front of us here with the zebra. And I'm just trying to get out of the way, uh, get out of their way, basically because they're a little bit intimidated by the lights that are on. Sorry, I'm just going to turn those on. There we go, we can have those on. But they really do get completely flummoxed by the sight of a light. And as most of you will know, of course, doesn't matter which part of the world you are, all kind of herbivores are, like deer, are completely and utterly astonished by nighttime lights. And the ones here, of course, they're all over here. We're on Cheetah Cut Line, which is the eastern fringe of Juma. And the reason uh, everything is kind of uh, here is because it's clear. So they're able to see what's coming to get them if they want to. And unfortunately, there's a car coming towards me, which could result in a large accident if I turn all my lights off. But we'll just keep going stoically and hopefully turn off this road before we hit anything else. Where's the turn off, Brian? It's coming up, isn't it? 
Anyway, what an afternoon we've had. Hasn't it been special? We're back on radio, which means we can hear the dulcet, quite deep tones of Rebecca Christensen. She, of course, back from leave today, straight into the hot seat. And what a day to begin with. Wild dogs. <laughs> Rebecca says she will try and talk in a high-pitched voice, everybody. No, Rebecca, there's no need at all. Uh, your, your husky voice is quite satisfactory as it is. I'll just all turn, turn here. Now, one of the great... Mm -hmm. Side lights, thank you, Brian. Brian was just whispering there. There we go. Um, one of the great advantages of or disadvantage of, of these spotlights is that they get very hot. And um, one day, this is of course night time, so it's storytelling time now in case we don't find anything. One day I was at Ngala Private Game Reserve up to the north of where we are here. And um, the tracker and ranger had just dropped their guests off. And what used to happen was that the ranger used to get out of the car, take the rifle, go and put it in the safe, and then meet the tracker at the back of the lodge. And the tracker would drive around. And this tracker took his um, spotlight and he just put it down next to him like that on a blanket. And then carried on, drove around, uh, didn't notice the sort of gentle smell of hot wool or probably nylon next to him, took his cooler box off the car and went to put it away and was having a chat with his friend when the general manager came out of his office and said, fire, fire. And uh, the Land Rover was on fire as a result of the spotlight being left on the uh, super flammable uh, acrylic slash nylon blanket. And so, you know, another hazard of the job, Brian, is operating this very hot spotlight. Yeah. But I do it, you know, I do it without fear. Yes, it's very, very brave of me. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'm afraid we did see, which we didn't see with you, because it was so brief and it was all in the dark, was a spotted eagle owl today being chased by some drongos. It leapt into the air out of a tree and was chased by a whole lot of drongos and um, eventually it got away, but I'm afraid it all happened rather too fast for us to call you over, especially as it would have had to have been done on WhatsApp. It's a nice word, that, don't you think, Brian? Yeah. What's up? Oh, there's an elephant. Just to the right, we're just going to drive straight past it. There we go. Hello, Junkie. You're a new viewer, and it's a very easy question for me to answer from you. You say, do I prefer day or nighttime safaris, and am I not afraid at night? Um, junkie, I'm not afraid at night, but that's just because I've been in around this area for a long time. It's not because um, I'm... It's not because I'm particularly brave or stoic or anything else like that. It's just the time that I've spent out here. If I was on foot, Junkie, I would be absolutely terrified out of my wits to be walking around here, especially on a windy, moonless night like this one. It would be very dangerous indeed for a human being to be out here on foot in the night time. Not during the day if you are well trained. Now, I far prefer driving around dawn and dusk than I do to the night time. I've never been the hugest fan of the night safari. I'm not sure why. Many, many people love night safaris. Um, I guess I just prefer the fact that in the day I can see distance, I can see far. And I think that goes as a throwback to our evolutionary history. You know, it's. Um, uh, we reckon that's why human beings are scared of the dark is because of course way back when when our evolution when our ancestors had just sort of leapt out of the trees as it were and were heading into the plains of East Africa they of course had to be scared of the dark because that's when their major predators the lions and the hyenas were active and I think much the same as me, I quite like the fact that during the day I can see. And I'm, while I'm interpreting that as preferring the day, I think you'll find that it's probably something deep-seated in my, maybe even in my reptilian brain, saying, well, 
you don't want to be able not to see far into the distance because then you cannot see what's coming to eat you. But uh, Junkie, most of the time there's nothing coming to eat us, which is excellent. Now, Taylor would like to tell you about what she's going to do tonight. Uh, tell her to tell you a nighttime story. I'm sure it'll be a good one. That's called tossing your. <laughs> James, that's a big request. A nighttime story? Hmm. Now I need to try and think of one. You see, James wasn't specific as to what nighttime story he wanted me to tell. Uh, David, give me a topic and let's see if I've got any stories. My brain has gone, it's shut down for some bizarre reason and I can't even think of one story, which is unusual because we know I love to tell a good story. Okay, the sto someone in the bush at night. Um, oh my goodness, I'm under pressure and I don't know what to do. I just want to find a chameleon so I can talk about the chameleon now. Oh, okay, so... Rebecca fed the, the question in my ear about James telling the story about the vehicle that caught fire. And I also experienced something similar when I actually had just started guiding and somebody had left their spotlight on, but it was a brand new vehicle, like brand new, I think it was about a week old and burnt it down to a crisp. You can imagine though that Ranger was not very popular and had an unfortunate uh, series of unlucky events because a, a couple of, uh, luckily he kept his job and a few weeks later, or it was a few a month or something afterwards, he then drove another, like a big, a big uh, taxi-like vehicle, like we, I don't know if you've seen the taxis in South Africa, we've got mini, a minibus, there we go, that's the word I'm looking for. And, um, well, he reversed that and then drove it into a tree and a branch came through the window. So now that's what I call unlucky. But I'm try I can't think of a good nighttime story. I don't know why. I've had some interesting ones. Have I told you about the stories of me bumping into the lions on the pathways at night? Maybe I haven't, but I'll tell, maybe I have. I'll just tell them again though. So, because it doesn't seem like there's chameleons around here. But so what, a couple of times, guests would ask me as we were walking back to the rooms about, have you ever seen anything on the pathways? And I'd go, no, it's not very common. You know, occasionally something. And it would always be when someone would say, and any lions? And then I'd go, no. And as I would say, no, we'd come around the corner and there'd be a pride lion sitting on the pathway. But I'm not too worried about it. Then they normally moved off. You give a clap of the hands or a stamp of the feet and off they scuttle, which was good. And I've encountered buffalo a few times on the pathways, but they were nice buffalo. They also just ran off, thank goodness, not like the one that I occurred. It was obviously the grumpiest buffalo in the Sabi Sands, the one that charged me while I was on foot looking for insects for James while he was in the tent. Now, speaking of insects, I'm looking for any beetles that are on the ground. Where are you? We've been seeing a lot of twin spot beetles now. I'm hoping we're gonna see maybe another ground beetle, maybe a, a velvet ant. You know what I am seeing flying around? Let's see if we can see it land. David, I know it's difficult. Can you see this thing? Yes, you can. Wow, that's very impressive. I don't know if you got a glimpse of that little eye as it was flying around. It's disappeared now, but there's quite a few ant lions, adult ant lions around, which is quite nice. And I've I think I've showed you a couple. We often see them here at night, uh, in the mornings, after they've uh, fallen into the vehicles. Then I pick them up and then release them again. But that one didn't want to stick around. Where are all the animals this evening? It's a nice night. Oh, here we go. Here's something. Hello, beetle. There's a beetle. It's running away. What beetle is that? Oh, that is, where did you go? There it is. That is a two-spot beetle. Quite common around here. And that's quite a large one too. You can see massive antennae, probably out looking for something to eat. And my highlight of these beautiful beetles has to be when we did the safari marathons, when James was in the Mara and we had the first bit of rain and we saw them mating. So I think that this is probably a female. Typically with insects, the females are larger than the males. And that was, that was quite fun. And we did see a couple of ones that had been squashed by, I don't know what, whether it was an elephant or a vehicle, I'm unsure. But remember the sighting we had where the ants, though, were making use 
of the beetle and they were feasting upon it. And that's what I love is that absolutely nothing gets wasted out here. Let's see what it's going to do. No, don't go too fast. You've got to try and keep up with your little beetle. Just scurrying, scurrying along, checking all the little crevices. I wonder what it even feasts on. I'm actually not sure if it feeds on other insects or if it eats vegetation. I must admit, for some bizarre reason, that fact has slipped my mind. So perhaps you can give me a helping hand this evening. Seeing as though my brain seems to have switched off. Maybe one of you could help me out and tell me, what does a twin spot beetle eat? Or two spot beetle, as they're also known as. And you can either do that by hashtagging Safari Live on Twitter, or you can send us an email, questions at wildearth.tv. And I would very much appreciate your assistance is that I think obviously the file cabinets are full and maybe I read something new today. I was actually reading about chameleons this afternoon and uh, I think that obviously some of the twin spot beetle information I have has been thrown out and then a couple more files have been added of the chameleon. So I'm now itching to find a chameleon so I can tell you all about these wonderful things that I learned that I, I didn't even know that they could do but i'm not going to tell you just yet until we find one of those wonderful animals i think james is behind me he's following me stalker what's he doing back there maybe it's not even him it could be someone else and i could just be falsely accusing james of course oh my goodness we don't want to disorientate the impala now let's see if we can have a look there's about 150 million impala here i'm not going to shine directly on them i'm just going to just put my spotlight up slightly. And you, can you see all of them? And they all come out into the open, obviously to seek refuge and not to, of course, uh, hide away in the bushes so that the predators can sneak up to them. And that's why I keep wanting to come here at sunset when we eventually get another sunset because we can see beautiful silhouettes of the animals. And we'll go past them. And I don't know if you've ever seen it before. Maybe you've seen videos or perhaps you could have seen it with us as we try and dim our lights as we go. But oh, solifuge. Hang on. I got distracted, but I found a solifuge. Now we need to just do a, a turn. No, come back here. Okay, I'm going to keep my eye on the solifuge just because I can see where it is. Where did it go? Now there's, I just want to dim my lights and let this vehicle come past us and we shall try and find it again. Good evening. Yeah, nah, let's look for the solifuge. Now probably we're going to come back out on the road again. We know they like to hunt out in the open. Where did you go? Oh, I think I've lost it. Where did it go? Christina, thank you for answering and helping me with the, the search to what do twin spot beetles eat. Apparently they eat aphids and other little creatures, which is fantastic. Now, I don't know where the solifuge gone. I mean, they, they move quickly, but they can't move that quick. They can't disappear that fast. I'm very disappointed that I didn't get to see my solifuge. It was moved too quickly and perhaps it found a mound that was full of termites and is now having a great dinner. I'm not sure and I hopefully will try and find another one so you can have a look at what a solifuge looks like, but we'll just have to wait till next time. Now it's come to that time of the drive where myself and David are gonna have to say goodbye to you, but I hope you enjoyed the Nkahumas and everything else and all the other wonderful creatures we saw along the way. It's been great, but we'll see you bright and early for the sunrise safari. Good night. Let's head over to James. I'm not sure how bright it's going to be early tomorrow morning, everybody. Rain predicted, but of course it was predicted today and nothing has fallen. Brian, you've had two spots of rain, haven't you? Yes. yes. Oh, three. three. Three? Good grief. Now, we are looking desperately for a chameleon. That was a small scrub hare running terrifiedly across the front of the vehicle. Brian has been quite obsessive, I have to tell you, about chameleon on the way home. We have got exactly Exactly 90 seconds to find it. Brian, I'm going to drive a little bit faster to the next bushel. There's nothing on that bushel, nor on this one. No. 
How very bad, how very sad, how very, very dare us. Please forget I said that, everyone. That's the problem with being live, Brian. You cannot edit what you've said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't edit what you've sung either. Right, no chameleons, I'm afraid, everybody. And just remember, at night time, I find it very difficult to look into your eyes while I'm trying to find animals with a spot slight. All right, that's going to be it from us this evening. What a very special time of it we've had. Began before drive, of course, with the lioness killing the buffalo. Then we headed straight across to Cheetah Plains. Marvellous time with those wild dogs on the hunt. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, John. A big thank you to the thumb, the mustachioed thumb. Okay. There it is. To Rebecca and Kirsten, the final control with Louise and Jerry and Taylor and uh, David. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Bye-bye.